Uh, welcoming everybody to our third women's conference, Womanhood Inspired. And uh, each time, mashallah, we try to uh, focus on uh, drawing inspiration from um, women in our history to inspire women of, our, of the present and future, inshallah. And so we thought it would be really nice as we kick off Rabi' al Awwal the month the Prophet ﷺ was born, that we take inspiration from women who were inspired by the character of the Prophet ﷺ. And so today we're going to spend time uh, learning about different Sahabiyat um, who embodied a, a part of the prophetic character that inshallah will inspire us. So I'm going to pass the mic so she can start our program off with some recitation. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. إذا وقعت الواقعة ليس لوقعتها كاذبة خافضة رافعة إذا رجت الأرض رجا وبست الجبال بسا فكانت هباء منبثا وكنتم أزواجا ثلاثة فأصحاب الميمنة ما أصحاب الميمنة وأصحاب المشأمة ما أصحاب المشأمة والسابقون السابقون والسابقون السابقون أولئك المقربون في جنات النعيم ثلة من الأولين وقليل من الآخرين على سرور موضونة متكئين عليها متقابلين يطوف عليهم ولدان مخلدون بأكواب وأباريق وكأس من معين when the inevitable event takes place, then no one can deny it has come. It will debase some and elevate others. When the earth will be violently shaken and the mountains will be crushed to pieces, becoming scattered particles of dust, you will all be divided into three groups. The people of the right, how blessed they will be. The people of the left, how miserable will they be. And the foremost in faith, in faith will be the foremost in paradise. They are the ones nearest to Allah in the gardens of bliss, they will be a multitude from earlier generations and a few from later generations. All will be on jeweled thrones reclining face to face. They will be waited on by eternal youths with cups, pitchers, and a drink of pure wine from a flowing stream that will cause them neither headache nor intoxication. They will also be served any fruit they wish to choose and meet from any bird they desire. MashaAllah. All right, so Stella Fusayna is a Ghanaian American student and teacher of Quranic Arabic under the guidance of Sheikh Abdul Nasser Janga. She graduated from the Qalam Seminary program in 2015. She completed memorization of the Quran in January 2018. She recently completed Ijazah in the Ashura Suhra and Ashura Kubra readings of the Quran. She's currently a student of the Hadith in, at the Critical Loyalty Institute. She holds a BA in computer science and a master's in information systems. She lives with her family in Texas for now. <laughs> and works as a software developer. Where does she belong? Texas. In the Bay. <laughs> so without further ado, Bismillah, we welcome uh, Stada Fusayna, inshallah. All right, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim We have a beautiful topic today that we are going to spend the next 30 or so minutes talking about. It's a topic that I really enjoy uh, studying and one that I really enjoy learning about but sometimes it can be a little bit daunting I think uh, in some circles the way we talk about it and the way we discuss it we're talking about sacrifice okay sacrifice um, 
before we start, maybe let's see if let's test out my teacher student theory. Would anyone here like to give me their one def one sentence definition of what it, what does sacrifice mean? If you're explaining, yes. Very good. Giving up something for something else. That's very good. Mashallah, that's a good uh, definition. I'm going to add to your definition just a little bit. The uh, formal definition of sacrifice is to give up something you value. So give up something valuable for something else that you deem to be more important and more valuable. Okay? So you're giving up something valuable for something else more valuable and more important. That is the definition of a sacrifice. There are many amongst the companions of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, who personified this trait. And of course, the Prophet وسلم, himself also personified this trait. Today, inshallah ta'ala, we are going to be looking at the example of Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha, who has the distinct honor of being the first martyr of the nation of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay? We're going to start off with just some facts. I'm gonna give you some facts, okay? The reason I'm gonna do this instead of just telling her story is I want you to have a context. It's important when we study the Sahaba to paint a picture of what they were living in. Who was this person? What was their society? What was their context? So that we can really appreciate what this person went through. Okay? Y'all ready? So I'm going to tell you three things about Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha that I want you to remember. Number one, her age. Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha was about 20 years older than the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. How many years older? 20 years. She was also a black Abyssinian woman, so originally from Ethiopia, modern-day Ethiopia. She was a black Abyssinian woman. So one, 20 years older than the Prophet Sallallahu Two, she was a black Abyssinian woman. The third thing that you need to know about her is that she was a slave. She was a slave. She was owned by a man named uh, Abu Hudayfa ibn al-Mughira. Okay? So what are the three things we're remembering about her? Number one? age, 20 years older than the Prophet Sallallahu Number two, she's a black Abyssinian woman, so she's not from Mecca, right? Number three, she's a slave to a man named Abu Hudayfa ibn al-Mughira. Uh, Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha was married to a man named Yasir. Yasir radiallahu ta'ala anhu, also a sahaba, or a sahabi, uh, Yasir was actually an immigrant to Mecca from Yemen. So he wasn't originally from Mecca either. He was from Yemen. And when he came to Mecca, he sought the protection of Abu Hudayfa, who owned Sumayya. And so it is Abu Hudayfa who said, yes, you can be under my protection, and here you can marry my slave woman. And that's how the two of them were married, and they had a son named Ammar bin Yasir. Ammar was about the same age as the Prophet Sallallahu Okay? So everybody with me so far? We've painted a picture of the family. Now, the next thing we have to do is we have to talk politics. Now, y'all know how we Texans feel about Californians, so I'll just talk about Meccan politics today, and we'll, we'll leave off American politics, okay? So let's understand what was the politics of Mecca when the Prophet Sallallahu uh, began his message, okay? Now, the Prophet Sallallahu is in a tribe called Quraysh. Quraysh is made up of many little clans, like little families that are within the tribe of Quraysh. All right. The clan that Sumayya is owned by is called Banu Makhzum. Okay, so Sumayya is from a clan called Banu Makhzum. What's the name of the Prophet's clan? Banu Hashim. Okay, so you have Banu Makhzum, Banu Hashim. Y'all have to realize that Banu Makhzum and Banu Hashim are rivals. They've had this rivalry going on for decades, right? So Banu Makhzum looks at Banu Hashim and they're like, oh, y'all think you're wealthier than us? We're going to show you our wealth is more. Oh, okay, so y'all think you're better at poetry? We're going to go ahead and we're going to show you when the next poetry slam comes up what we can do. Oh, you guys think you're more hospitable? Well, we're going to come out when the pilgrims come out. We're going to roll out the welcome mat like nobody's seen, right? Banu Makhzum always wants to compete with Banu Hashim. 
and they're neck and neck, right? Banu Makhzum doesn't feel right now that Banu Hashim is uh, better than them until the Prophet Sallallahu comes along and Banu Hashim has a prophet. From the eyes of Banu Makhzum, they don't look at it like Allah has blessed us, he sent us a prophet, you know, we're so blessed to be in the presence of the prophet. No, they look at it and they think, oh no, if we accept this man, then we have to accept Banu Hashim as an authority over us. And they can't have that. So they get very upset. And they start a campaign against the Prophet Sallallahu and against the prophethood of the Prophet Sallallahu Does anyone want to guess who else is in Banu Makhzum who doesn't like the Prophet Sallallahu Just a wild guess. Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl is one of these members of Banu Makhzum, the clan that Sumeya is in, and he hates Banu Hashim, and he hates the Prophet Sallallahu Imagine how he must feel then when a poor slave woman and her family go against this rivalry and they choose to recognize the truth and accept the Prophet ﷺ as their leader. Abu Jahl can't take it. He is angry. And he says, I'm going to make an example of these people. And all of the people who didn't have any means of protection, they didn't have any family, they were considered the lowest of the low in the society. If we look at Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha, she is at a complete disadvantage if you look at socioeconomic status, if you look at family ties, right? She's literally in the worst position possible if you look at it from that perspective. And yet, she is intelligent enough to be able to recognize the truth and accept it. While someone like, while someone like Abu Jahl, with all of his status and all of his wealth and all of his position, was not able to accept the truth. So Abu Jahl gets really enraged and he starts to torture these people publicly. And his goal is to scare other people that if you go against Banu Makhzum, this is what's going to happen to you. And as he is torturing these people, Sumayya ta'ala anha and her family, publicly, they're not wavering in their resolve. Now, I want us to pause here. I want to ask you all something. How old was the Prophet Sallallahu when he became a prophet and received revelation? 40. So how old was Sumayya? 60. 60. She's 60 years old. And this kind of makes me tear up a little bit because my mom is in her 60s. And I, I just can't imagine anyone even insulting her, let alone beating her or harming her. Right? Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha was in her 60s. And Abu Jahl would come and he would put chain mail on them and leave them out in the sun. He would beat them, he would insult them, he would scream at them, he would tell them to renounce their faith and insult the Prophet ﷺ. But Sumayya and her family, they stood strong and Sumayya would respond to him and say, no, enemy of Allah, I will never do that. And she would insult him. It's narrated that when she accepted Islam, she went to the Prophet ﷺ and she said to him, she said, Ashhadu. I bear witness that indeed you are the messenger of Allah. And your promise is true. You see the amount of faith she had. She had no doubt in the Prophet ﷺ or in his message. And that faith gave her strength. And we know that the stronger she got, the angrier Abu Jahl got until it got to the day when he told her that she must curse the Prophet ﷺ in public and she refused and spat in his face. And at this point, he took his spear and ran it through her midsection and killed her. And so Sumayya anha became the first martyr, an old black woman who was a slave, who had never seen any good in this life at the very end of her life, Allah Taala shows her her position in Jannah, because we know that the martyr is shown their position in Jannah, right? So at the end of her life, this is 
where Allah Santa Allah gives her glad tidings and congratulates her and shows her the beautiful future that she is now embarking on. Her husband Yasser was even older than her and he died actually soon after she passed away. He was very frail as well and his body couldn't take it. And we know that their son Ammar eventually said the words that Abu Jahl had commanded him to say and the Prophet Sallallahu what did he say to Ammar when Ammar was feeling so sad and so devastated and traumatized? The Prophet Sallallahu told him, if they tell you to do that again, go ahead and say the words. Because I know it's not in your heart. Right? Now, I want us to just come back for a minute. We were in Mecca thousands of years ago. Let's come back to California in 2022. And let's ask ourselves about sacrifice, now that we have heard the legacy that came before us. We said that it is giving up something you value for something you deem to be more important. Sumaya radiallahu ta'ala anha gave up her life. Before that, she gave up her comfort, her safety. Her dignity was taken from her. She gave up a lot, and these are valuable things. That's the first thing I want us to recognize about sacrifice. It does require us to give up something we care about. It's important to realize this because sometimes in our own lives when we are called to sacrifice for the sake of Allah, we have a hard time recognizing that we're losing something as well. And sometimes that loss comes with a feeling of grief. Right? Think about, for example, somebody who has an amazing job, they love their coworkers, the pay is wonderful, and then they start to do some research and they say, you know what, this business that I'm working at is not a halal business, right? It's not, it's not a great place to be working. Uh, the business itself doesn't align with my faith. They quit their job. They did something, they left something for the sake of something more important, but there is still a loss and it's okay to acknowledge that, right? I say this because the Prophet ﷺ cared very much about Ammar and the loss that he had gone through when he lost his mother and then his father. I want you to think what the state of Ammar who must have been because realize that after his mother died, Abu Jahl continued walking the streets of Mecca a free man for many years, right? Abu Jahl died in the Battle of Badr, but his mother was one of the very first believers and died in the very early days of Islam. So it's probably another five, six, seven years before the Battle of Badr. What must it be like to watch the man who brutally tortured and murdered one's mother just walking around in his tribe, no arrest, no trial, no justice, no care from the society? It was a great loss. But people didn't look at Ammar and say, well, your parents are in Jannah. Why are you sad? No, people didn't tell him that. They comforted him. And when Abu Jahl was actually killed in the Battle of Badr, the Prophet ﷺ made a point to find Ammar and tell him that Allah has killed the one who murdered your mother. Know that that justice that you needed, that trial that you longed for, Allah has taken care of it for you, right? Because he lost something valuable. It's okay to acknowledge that we have lost something that was valuable to us. The second part of our definition is you're giving up something you value for, something that is more valuable and more important. What was more valuable and more important to Sumaya radiallahu ta'ala anha? What was it that she longed for? I need y'all to be louder. Her faith, what else? Jannah, what else? Allah Azza wa Jal, right? The pleasure of Allah to stand up for the truth, to stand up for justice, to show others that she would not be moved, right? Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha believed in the promise of Allah. And she stood by it until the end. May Allah SWT be pleased with her. And this is what I wanted us to end with. Because you see, making a sacrifice is not easy. 
right? We will all go through something in our lives where we have to make a decision about something that might not be the best for our faith. It could be a job, it could be the company that you keep, it could be where you work, where you live, whatever it is, right? And in that moment, somebody might say, but I'm so afraid of losing this. I'm so afraid of losing this job and this amazing income. I'm so afraid of losing these friends who I have, right? I'm afraid of losing this. There is an answer that one might share with them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us. You see, here's the thing. Everybody in their life will experience some kind of loss, right? Life has ups and downs. Nobody's life is perfect. Nobody is 100% happy in this life, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises us, and he makes this declaration in Surah Al-Baqarah, where he says, Allah says that without a doubt, we will test you through some sort of fear that you might face, hunger, a reduction in uh, wealth, and even in lives, and in fruits. And this is everybody in the world, Muslims and non-Muslims. We're all going to go through trials. What's the difference then between a person of faith like Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha and a person who's lacking faith? The difference is the benefit that they get from that trial. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ At the end of this ayah or at the end of this statement, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ Congratulate those who are steadfast and have resolve. الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا Those who, when some sort of difficulty comes to them, they say, and what is it that the Qur'an tells us to say at this point? إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ This is not something you say only when someone passes away, but it's something that we actually say during any sort of difficulty. Why? because it helps to ground us and it gives us a perspective inna lillahi indeed we belong to Allah why is this important? because it reminds me that I might be feeling a loss but Allah owns me right? I belong to Allah and so I don't really own anything in this life right? how can I say I own something and therefore I lost something when everything, even I belong to Allah so that's the first per thing, the first perspective that we have to have. The second perspective is, We're returning back to Allah. It reminds me to focus on the bigger picture, right? I might not be worried so much about losing a six-figure job when I'm thinking about the Akhirah. No six-figure job can buy you the Akhirah, the paradise that the Prophet ﷺ promised Sumayya and her family, no money can buy that. No status can buy that. No president or king or queen can ask Allah to give you that. Right? Once you realize that, then you start to prioritize a little bit more. That thing that we were worried about might become a little less important. And pleasing Allah, keeping our faith, and moving forward and growing to to become better servants of Allah becomes more important to us, right? So we say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Allah subhanahu wa says, those people, ula'ika alayhim salawatun min rabbihim wa rahmah. Those people will have Allah's blessings and his mercy. Wa ula'ika hum al-muhtadun. Those are the ones who are truly guided, right? Allah subhanahu wa is giving us a perspective. There's another ayah that's very similar to this that I really like. Um, this ayah is in regards to the Muslims um, when they are in times of war. So this ayah is particularly talking about in times of war, but it can be generalized as well, where the Prophet ﷺ, or, sorry, Allah Azza wa Jal tells uh, the believers, "Wala tahinu al qawm." Don't get tired and don't stop uh, pursuing the enemy. In takunu ta'lamuna, fa innahum ya'lamuna kama ta'lamu. 
If you're experiencing some sort of loss or you're suffering, then realize that they are also experiencing loss and suffering. Right? I mean, this is a battlefield. Everybody's going to experience loss. There's going to be difficulty. But what's the difference between you two? وَتَرْجُونَ مِنَ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَرْجُونَ You Muslims, you have hope in something from Allah that they could never hope for. You have hope in something from Allah that they could never hope for. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَلِيمًا حَكِيمًا Allah SWT is all-knowing and wise. Allah SWT knows what we're going through. Right? He is a ra'uf. He knows what we're going through. And he cares about us. Allah SWT sees the pain. Sometimes people don't understand our sacrifices. Sometimes people belittle our sacrifices. Because remember we said you're sacrificing something you value. Other people may not value that thing that you sacrificed. Right? People are different. Um, I'll give you, you all, all want to hear an example? I'll give you an example. So I grew up in Saudi Arabia. I was there for 17 years. Um, then I moved to Iowa for college. Do you know one thing that's in Saudi Arabia that we don't really have in Iowa? You want to guess? Halal, yes, thank you. Here somebody gets it. Halal meat. Halal meat. So we moved to Iowa and we're basically on this vegetarian diet. I moved with my twin sister. So we're on this vegetarian diet. And my, here's my twin sister. Oh my God, it's so hard being vegetarian, so hard to find food. And I couldn't understand her suffering. Do you know why? I've been vegetarian since I was five. <laughs> I don't like the taste of meat. It does not taste like food to me. So I didn't really care. Ustadha Maryam mentioned the ayah in Surah Waqi'ah, right? وَلَحْمِ طَيْرٍ مِمَّا يَشْتَهُونَ My sister loves Surah Al-Waqi'ah. She always quotes this ayah to me. She's like, you need to get to Jannah so you can eat meat and like it. <laughs> Right? So her sacrifice, I, I couldn't value it. I mean, I understood she was a little miserable, right? All y'all who eat meat can probably sympathize with her more than I did. But I didn't value it. Yeah, I had my corn. Iowa's corn country, and they have great corn, and I really like corn. Uh, right? So I couldn't value her sacrifice. I didn't understand what the big deal is. There's plenty of food. Right? Yeah, some people here are like, you are a terrible sister. Right? But that's how I felt. And, and may Allah Santa reward her for her, her sacrifice and forgive me for being unsympathetic. Um, but people won't always understand what you're going through. But Allah sees it. Right? So whenever we are called to stand for what is right, to give up something we value, for something even more important, we have to remember that Allah sees us. And Allah understands us better than we understand ourselves. And even if the rest of the world doesn't know what you went through to get to where you are, or they don't appreciate what you went through and they don't acknowledge it, Allah sees it, Allah appreciates it, and Allah acknowledges it. So I pray that Allah SWT allows us to be people of true faith, who are able to overcome the difficulties that we have in this life because we have hope in Allah in the next life. I pray that Allah Santa allows us to look at the example of Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha, our beautiful forerunner in the deen, and allows us to really appreciate what she and her family went through in order for us to be able to inherit this beautiful deen and to be able to practice it. I pray that Allah SWT allows us to be people of true sabr and Allah SWT allows us to be people who when we are going through difficulty we say with sincerity inna lillahi wa inna ilihi raji'un and we pray to him and we ask him for his guidance. May Allah SWT uh, accept all that is said and heard here today. Anything that I have said that may have been incorrect, I pray that you all forgive me. I pray Allah SWT forgives me. And I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal will allow us all to uh, reunite with those we love in Jannah. I pray that Allah SWT allows us all to meet the Prophet SAW and his companions and Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha um, and to, to, you know, finally thank them for everything they went through for us. May Allah SWT make it easy for all of us. Barakallahu feekum.
Jazakallah khairan. Ustadha Fasila, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. So Ustadha Hasai Mujaddidi is co-founder of the uh, Mental Health for Muslims, a site dedicated to providing mental health-related content tailored to the Muslim community. She has served the American Muslim community for over 20 years as a spiritual advisor, mental health advocate, writer, editor, mediator, interfaith organizer, and public speaker, covering a variety of topics, including women's issues, marriage, family, youth and teen issues, education, self-development, interfaith bridge building, spirituality, and many, many more things. Mashallah, she's just amazing, alhamdulillah. She currently offers monthly self-development and spiritual wellness classes uh, with the MCC East Bay here. So you can look at her schedule online if you go to mcceastbay.org. She has regular classes here, and she offers regular educational workshops for students and teachers at the local Islamic schools. She also provides periodic talks throughout California and nationally for the Muslim community on, a, on various topics. She enjoys reading and writing and blogging and, uh, via social media, doing arts and crafts, visiting gourmet coffee shops, exploring the countless beautiful beaches and state parks in this beautiful state of California, Stade of Pisena. <laughs> where she lives with her husband and two sons. And uh, she has a website, Um Her topic today, uh, Resilience Personified, Asma bint Abi Bakr radiallahu anha, uh, expands on her willingness to help protect the Prophet ﷺ when his life was threatened despite her complex condition, she's pregn uh, pregnant, the trek she made to the cave, all, uh, also other notable moments like her immediate submission uh, when when uh, reminded to cover adequately and the dignity she accepted being corrected. So inshallah, we welcome Ustada Hussai. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen. Sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Now I chose um, Asma bint Abu Bakr because when I was thinking about, you know, who do I want to learn from? And there's so many incredible uh, women in our, in our tradition. But I realized I had very limited knowledge about her. And I thought, like, what do I know about her as, you know, someone who's clearly a figure in our tradition? And, she, and, and I thought, there's only a handful, maybe two stories that I can think of. So I intentionally chose her because I wanted to learn more about her. And this is where you know, for all of you to keep in mind, we are students of knowledge. You know, we, we, we sit up here and we might seem like we're, you know, in this position of teaching, but we are actually always learning. And I know that we're always learning. So for me, I'm so grateful for these programs because they allow me the opportunity to also learn. So I am excited to share what I have learned about this extraordinary example for all of us. So she is Asma, of course, the daughter of Sayyidina Abu Bakr, as well as Qutayla bin Abdul Uzza. And she was the first wife of Sayyidina Abu Bakr. She did not become Muslim. So they actually divorced before the Prophet's mission began. So um, she's the half-sister of, of course, our mother, Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu anha, whose mother was uh, Umr Man. So just important things to know, because sometimes you hear that they're sisters, but that distinction is important. Now, according to Ibn Kathir, Asma radiallahu anha was about 10 years older than Aisha radiallahu anha, but others like Imam al-Dhahabi uh, say that it was a much bigger, wide, wider age gap between 13 and 19 years. So um, Allah knows. But she embraced Islam at 11 years old. Are there any 11-year-olds here? Any, anybody 11, 10 in that range? Anybody has a daughter that's 10, 11? I just think about, I mean, I have a 10-year-old soon to be 11. Think about what a precious time that is, and that, you know, subhanAllah, through her father, of course, uh, she embraced this faith. And I just thought, wow, she, you know, at such a young, tender age, she, um, the faith, you know, entered her heart. She's considered, uh, again, there's a difference of opinion, to be the 15th, some say 17th, some say 18th person to become Muslim in the earlier community. So she was prominent from the very beginning, she was there and she was like all the earlier converts, they would gather in Dar al-Arqam and study with the Prophet And in those earlier years, we don't know much about her life, but we do know that she marries another very important person who is um, Az-Zubair ibn al-Awwam, and who is he, radiallahu anhu. He is the son of al-Awwam ibn Khuwaylid, who is the brother of Sayyidina Khadija, our mother Khadija, radiallahu anha. So making her, um, him, um, her nephew. 
uh, Sayyida Khadija's uh, nephew. And then his mother is Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib, who is the Prophet's aunt. So that makes him the first cousin to the Prophet Sallallahu So she marries someone, again, from this incredibly noble, from both mother and father, her lineage is very noble. And he um, is also considered the fourth or fifth male adult to become Muslim in that earlier community. So just a, an amazing pairing. And of course he, just FYI, he goes on to be part of the Ashara Mubashara, the 10 who are promised Jannah. So her husband is, again, an incredible, and he has his own story, uh, which one day, inshallah, maybe we can go into. But um, the Sayyidina Abu Bakr also brought him, by, by the way, also to Islam. So it's, kind of, it's really sweet, right? Like the man who would go on to be his daughter's husband came to Islam through him as well. Really beautiful. Now, um, their beginnings uh, as a couple were were uh, difficult. Like many of that earlier generation, they didn't have very much. And uh, Zubair al was known for um, having just one possession when he came to ask for her hand, uh, which was a horse. He didn't have much else other than this horse, but of course his character. And that's why uh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr gave him his daughter because of his incredible character. So they had very humble beginnings. And Asma talks about that in her um, you know, in her hadith, that she, she related some hadith, which we'll get to, but in some of those hadith, she talks about the challenges that she had as his wife and just, you know, the struggles of, of the, uh, the life that they had, the hardships and the poverty that they endured. So during, right before the hijrah or at that time, she becomes pregnant with her first son, another very notable in our uh, tradition, Abdullah ibn Az-Zubair, radiallahu anh. So she becomes pregnant with him, and this is when uh, the Prophet and Sayyidina Abu Bakr flee, right? We know the story that they go to seek uh, protection in uh, Thawr, uh, Thawr and, uh, for three days and three nights. And so they're looking to keep this obviously under wrap with only trusted people. And, you know, it's a very, you know, secret mission. But she steps up to the plate of taking on the responsibility as a pregnant woman in her third trimester. Anybody here in their third trimester? Anybody? Oh, mashallah. So we have one, a couple of sisters. Now I want you to think about this. You know, we, uh, those of us who have had children, we know what the third trimester is like. You can barely walk, you know, a few steps without needing a break, right? Your back is hurting. You've got a lot of things going on. So just, I just was floored when you read the description of what she did in that state. We have to remember, I mean, we're, we're talking about the middle of the desert, Mecca, leaving the outskirts with um, people seeking to kill uh, the Prophet Sallallahu and her father, but she steps up knowing that she is also with child and she clearly is in, in her act showing where her love and her priorities and her hearts are. She wants to protect the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi and she wants to protect her father even at the risk of her own life and her own child's life. So this is an extraordinary woman who goes out. I want you to take a guess. Does anyone know how far um, Ghar Thawr is from Mecca. How, how far? Anybody get? Take a guess, and, and use miles. You know, everything I read was like kilometers. I'm like, I'm I'm an American. I don't I don't know kilometers. So miles, please. Anybody? And miles. What do you think? How many miles? How many? Twenty miles. Mashallah. Anybody else? Any other guesses? Ten. Very close. Close. Seven miles. Seven miles. She would walk. It took her about two hours in the blazing sun as a third, as a pregnant woman in her third trimester. And this is where, you know, she again stepped up to the challenge and she, what was her purpose? She, need, she took them provisions and she acquired this beautiful nickname because when she was putting together the provisions, she didn't have anything. This is again to show you how little they had. She had nothing else to tie the water, um, uh, you know, the water, what is it called? The the, the leather water pouch, there's a term for it, but she didn't have anything to tie that or the food. So what did she do at that time? The women used to wear a waistband 
that would, uh, you know, prevent their, their dresses from falling. So she took that waistband and she tore it into two. And this is where she got the nickname Dhatu uh, Nitaqain, right, which is referring to the, the woman of two waistbands. Because when the Prophet saw what she had done, when, he, when she came and she's, you know, to untying her, you know, waistbands and giving them the provisions, he uh, made a beautiful dot for her and he said, indeed, Allah has given you. So the words are, are important to to pay attention to. Indeed, Allah has given you, in exchange for these waistbands, two waistbands in paradise. So he is indicating to her that she is in Jannah. She is guaranteed Jannah, which is, a, a, again, an extraordinary gift. So subhanAllah, this was her sacrifice, and she was, again, willing to take um, that, you know, that uh, trek into the desert, risking her own life, two hours, two hours there, two hours coming back, four hours for three days, right? Now, Fast forward, she alhamdulillah, you know, makes hijrah as well. And on her way to Medina, she delivers her baby. That's how close to delivery she was. And she delivers in Quba. And this was a really great, extraordinary moment for the Muslims there. Because at that point, the Jews were, you know, they, were, they had uh, spread this rumor that they were cursing the Muslims so that they would, nobody would ever have a baby in Medina. So she was, her son, Abdullah ibn Zubair, was the first infant to be born in Medina as a Muslim. So it, again, another great honor for her. And so the Muslims were, of course, celebrating his birth. Now, again, for those of us who have had children before, instinctually we know immediately you get the baby, whether you're at the hospital or at home or however the birth is, and your instinct as a mother is to latch on nurse. So I want you to imagine how much strength it takes for a mother to again think of, like, what is best for my baby? Instinctually, I feel like I need to nurse him. But she was aware that what was better for her infant was to send him to who? None other than Rasulullah for him to perform tahniq, which is the process of taking a date and mixing it with his saliva and breaking off a piece and putting it in the mouth of the infant so that it promotes well-being and health. And of course, any, uh, any mixture of his a uh, noble Mubarak, Mubarak saliva is, is shifa for him. So she did that. And, you know, again, just put yourself in her place, like to, to know these things and to separate yourself from your child upon birth. It's not easy to do for everybody. But, of course, these are people who had um, a greater understanding, subhanAllah. So she goes on in Medina to become, again, a devoted wife, a devoted mother. She bears seven more children, subhanAllah. I mean, I have two, and to me, I, <laughs> I'm like, ah, when I see anybody with two or more, I really, I'm just like in awe. But to imagine seven, subhanAllah, and again, in a time of, of immense difficulty, uh, but she went on and she did it, mashallah, and she spent her time um, just serving, serving her family. She was known to be incredibly charitable. This was one of her qualities that even her own son, Abdullah, uh, he in a hadith noted about her. He said that I have never known two more generous women other than my aunt Aisha, radiallahu anha, and my own mother, uh, Asma. Now, he made a, a really um, great observation in how they were different in their charity. And again, I want you to think about who matches your style more. So Aisha radiallahu anha, she was the type that would collect a good amount of money, right? So it's like she's saving, saving, saving. And then once she saved, or whatever it was, maybe it was food, then she would go and distribute it. But she had this habit of wanting to save it first and then at once give it away, right? So think, are you, do you follow that? Or do you follow Asma's example, radiallahu anha, which was to give it away immediately. So she didn't hold on to anything that was given to her. If it was in excess, she wanted to always give it away right away. So some of us, you know, we, we operate differently, but it's really nice to try to connect, like, where would I be in this spectrum, right? And so um, her uh, situation, as she, you know, lived with uh, Zubair in Medina and they you know, grew their family, actually turned around completely. He became one of the wealthiest men of Medina and then later Mecca uh, after the Fatah. So she was known then for feeding the poor and any time she got sick, which is a really good tip for us to think about. I remember my mother, Allah, anytime there was anything that happened to the family, 
her instinct was always sadaqa. She always had, she had, we had a, you know, on the mantle um, above the fireplace in her previous home, she had a Quran and then she would have a place right next to it that she would put her money that she was going to give for sadaqa. But it was her habit, anybody sick, anything happens, uh, God forbid a car, car accident. And this was the way, um, and so how many of us do that? Right? How many of us think, again, as soon as something befalls us, that we need to look to purifying our, uh, our wealth and, and seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help and also thinking of other people, benefiting other people, right? It's very natural to think of yourself and want to preserve yourself in those situations. But subhanAllah, um, you know, people of a greater understanding again knew that no, you want to take care of others. So this was her way as well and she would feed the sick and she would free the slaves. So this was her habit if she was ever sick. She was also known for teaching fiqh of Hajj for the, uh, during the Hajj season. And these are facts that just, you know, for your information. She narrated a total of five hadith, alhamdulillah. Um, and you can, you know, if you're ever reading books, you might see, you know, narrated by Asma, which is an incredible honor. We really have to think about the fact that, you know, there are so many people around the Prophet but not everybody is in the hadith collections. And here she is narrating five hadith. She also is a warrior on top of all of this. She fought in the battle of Yarmouk. Uh, later on in life, subhanAllah, so she was, an, she was actually on the battlefield and they said she was a fierce warrior. And anybody want to take a guess what age she reached before she passed? Just throw out a number. 90, older. Older than 90 years old. 100 years old. And subhanAllah, the climax of her story and right before she passed away is one of the most incredible things I've ever read. Her exchange with her own son. I just, you just can't help but just be so in awe and humbled by these women. Because again, we live in a time where, where we don't have these living examples. I mean, you know, I'm sure there's beautiful women everywhere, but these stories, these epic stories, uh, ba fighting battles, you know, raising seven children, suffering so, through famine and so many other things, um, uh, sanctions, and then to also live to 100 years old. But I'll get to that point in a moment about her, her end of her life. So there are a few really key lessons from her life that I just felt were really important to know in addition to all of that we just shared. The first, as was mentioned in uh, the description of this talk, was the hadith that a lot of us may associate with Asma, uh, bin Zabi Bakr radiallahu anha, which is the narration where she entered the Prophet's home. This is according to Aisha radiallahu anha, her sister, and she was wearing a thin garment, okay, a see through garment. And at that time, the Prophet, this was again before the ayah of hijab was revealed, um, but she, the Prophet turned away from her. And then he said to her, Oh, Asma, when a woman reaches the age of maturity, it is not proper for her to show anything but this and this, and that was referring to her hands and her face. So this uh, hadith is really important for us to think about as women for obviously the context, because we live in a time, as we know, women are exploited constantly, and women's fashion, even what has been introduced in the uh, you know, fashion of, of muhajjabat, many things would be considered inappropriate. And we have to just be real. We have very clear boundaries in our sharia about what is acceptable and what isn't. And this is why uh, this hadith is, is something we have to pay attention to. So when you get dressed, you have to think about, would I be someone that the Prophet ﷺ would turn away from based on what I'm wearing right now? I, I mean, I, would, I think that would be the most mortifying thing ever. I would do anything for him to have one glance of his. So is it worth it to wear the yoga pants? No, sisters, it is not. Is it worth it to wear the see-through things that show your shape just because you want to keep up with the fashion trends and look really this or that? No, if it compromises your standing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is not worth it. And that is why I so appreciate the grace and the beauty that Asma, she, she was in submission. She was in submission. She accepted it. She didn't challenge the Prophet Sallallahu And that's why we have to pay attention to the language of today, of the, the, the modern zeitgeist. It's all around these themes that are alien to our tradition. She wasn't triggered when he said that. 
She didn't take offense and personalize it and, you know, say, oh, the patriarchy. She understood this is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He, his entire life is for my salvation. So if he's going to tell me something to do or not to do, I will accept it. And she accepted it. And then, and then you know, the, the, the Mufassirin say that shortly after, um, that the, the verse of uh, you know, hijab was revealed. And the specific hadith relates to verse 31, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا Except for what is apparent, he goes, you know, tell the believing women to lower their gaze and guard their chastity and not to reveal their adornments except for what is apparent. So it's re she's, she had, you know, subhanAllah, a part in this beautiful verse being revealed to us. So she's, again, an extraordinary example for us. Um, and so we want to think about that. When we are, if our spouses or if our parents are challenging the way we dress, um, we have to think about what is their intention? Sometimes it could be control, and there's no real, you know, noble intention. It's just control. But other times, it actually is for your betterment. And it's good to question why. Not just what they're saying, but why are they saying that to me? You know, is it for some ulterior motive, or is it really because they're looking out for me? And nine times out of ten, inshallah, because you have, we, we want to always have the best of opinion of our parents and our, our family members and our loved ones, they are looking out for us. We just need to accept that and not question and have, you know, these doubts about everyone, which is what, again, the modern zeitgeist does. It just promotes this, you know, constant, you know, friction between us. So, really powerful um, uh, story about that. And there's, there's more, but for the sake of time, I'll go to the next point, which is her ghayra. This is also another really incredible lesson we can take from Asma. Asma was amazingly brave and courageous. She had real courage. She spoke out when, uh, whenever there was, uh, you know, I mean, we already saw, mashallah, what she did in terms of protecting the Prophet but even speaking to people and having the emotional intelligence and wisdom to know how to say certain things effectively, which is a tool, something we all need to learn. This is why grammar matters, rhetoric matters, our liberal arts matter, because we have to be empowered with language to be able to say things effectively. And she, in her discourse, in her dialogue, she was incredibly wise. So there's a story of her grandfather. So who is the father of Abu, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, his name is Abu Qahafa. So he did, had not yet accepted Islam when the Prophet and Abu Bakr migrated to Medina. He was still a non-Muslim. So he was really hurt that they fled because his grandchildren are left in, in his son's home without, in his estimation, any care. And he kind of um, came into the house and said to his grandchildren, oh, your father has left you in a really terrible situation. He's, he's taken all his money at that point. Abu Bakr took all of his money, which some say was around 6,000 dirham or dinar, to help the Muslims. So he took his wealth with him. And so when he, the, her, her grandfather walks in, seeing the situation of his grandchildren, he immediately you know, uh, says these things in a way to um, bring doubt into their hearts about you know, the, the, what, what her, their father did. But she had so much ghayra for her father, and as well as the image of Islam and the Muslims, that what did she do? He was blind, okay, so he was blind. So she went and she quickly gathered a little bag and she put pebbles in it, like stones, and then she put it in a, an area and covered it. And she took her grandfather by the hand, and she said, no, grandfather, he didn't leave us without anything, look. Touch this. This is all the money he left us. So he was like, oh, okay, in that case, then there's no blame if he left all of that for you. But she had this beautiful ghayra, again, to protect the image of her father, protect the image of the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims to do that. And then another story comes out of when she was in Medina. So now, fast forward seven years after she's, uh, she's left and she is in Medina, she's an established mother, has her own family. What happens? Her own mother, remember her own mother, Qutayla, who had not yet accepted Islam, she's still, and she uh, dies in that state, but she visits, the, uh, visits her, and she brings with her all of these treats and food and like ghee and raisins and other foods, and she wants to give all of these gifts to her daughter. Now Asma is conflicted, right? She's like, wait a second, even though you're my mother, you're still on the other side of this, and I need to make sure this is okay for me to even accept you as my guest and accept your gifts. So she had, again, that wisdom and that 
um, ghayra, deep ghayra for, for her faith, to go and ask the Prophet ﷺ through her sister Aisha, can I accept my mother even though she is not a Muslim and she's brought me all of these gifts? And this is also really relevant, okay? How many of you are converts in this room? MashaAllah. Now, Allahu Akbar. May Allah protect and preserve all of you and inshallah bring hidayah to all of your loved ones. We had a sister here. I don't know if she's here. I don't want to call her out, but she was here yesterday for our dhikr that we did. And her heart was really heavy. She's a convert. And she said, I have no support system. And this is the situation of many of our convert sisters, which is why it's so important that we hold space with one another and that we bring our convert sisters and brothers into our communities and make sure that they never, ever in their life feel that they have no support system. But we, all of us, and especially our converts, you owe Asma bint Abi Bakr a lot for what she did in this exchange. Because because of her and this situation with her mother and seeking the advice of the Prophet ﷺ, the ayah was revealed, which is, Allah does not forbid you from dealing kindly and fairly with those who have neither fought nor driven you out of your homes. Surely Allah loves those who are fair. This is chapter 60, verse 8. This ayah was revealed to reassure everyone whose family and loved ones have not yet adopted the faith that you can still have them in your life. You can still have a beautiful relationship with them as long as they're not forcing you out of their homes or, or torturing you or doing anything like that to, you know, again, bring them into your homes and, and, and treat them with the same love and dignity and respect. He gave that permission, and so she was relieved, and she accepted her mother. But another, again, incredible story that we get from Asma. The third is the story that she had with um, just such a powerful story, subhanAllah. So again, we're going to rewind a little bit when she didn't have a lot, and uh, you know her husband, Zubair, was struggling, and they had this horse. At that time in her life, she did a lot. She, was the, she would go out early and get water for the horse, feed the horse, bring it fodder. She would walk it. She would go and get um, date uh, seeds, and they would, they would at that time crush it. And it was a, pretty, a very labor-intensive life. And um, at one point, she had to walk about two miles to do this process of crushing these date stones, and then they would carry these massive things on their head. So I, again, try to visualize this. She's walking two miles, exhausted. She's been laboring all day, just trying to make it survive. And who comes and crosses her path? None other than the beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is his sister-in-law. So, you know, sometimes, and this is, again, something that we should just really appreciate that is lost, unfortunately, today in the nonverbal communication that can sometimes be really powerful. Not everything always has to be said. Sometimes the states and the hearts are communicating. So the Prophet Sallallahu sees his sister-in-law in this state. Without a single word, he stops his camel and orders the camel to kneel. And then he's, he makes a sound. Ikh, ikh, or ikh, ikh, something to that effect, which was an indication to her, like, come on, I got you. Sit, sit on the camel. I'm going to take you the rest of the way. He had this compassion for his sister-in-law, seeing her in this state. But subhanAllah, now I want you to see what she does. This is, again, emotional intelligence of a wife and a woman who is using her intellect to assess the situation. There's all these men here. The Prophet here. I could really use a ride, right? But my husband is jealous. I, I can't do it. Without words, without any words, what does she do? She just stands there. And the Prophet said again, he knows the hearts. No communication. They just understood each other. He understood that her shyness meant she wasn't going to get on, and he just proceeded forward. And she went home, rushed home to tell her husband about this whole incident, what happened, because she wanted to be transparent. We, and we have to, again, apply this in the modern context. A lot of things are happening in spaces, private, in marriages, and lives all over the place. And everybody's all about privacy now. Give me a break. You're married? Transparency. You should have, you know, access to, to one another's, you know, whatever is, is public, right? But this idea that, no, I can do my own thing and I don't have to share. So just let's learn from her. She wanted to 
again, show her husband that I honored you in your absence. So she tells him what happened, and his response is also really beautiful because it just gives us insight that they actually cared about one another, and it wasn't this whole, you know, power game all the time. Like, I want this and I want that. They weren't about that. They were about the hearts. So he told her, he said, by Allah, you're carrying the date stones and you being seen by the Prophet on, with that, you know, with it on your head in such a state is more shameful to me than you uh, having taken a ride with him. So he's letting her know, like, I'm pained that you were in this, that I've put you in this situation. I don't care about that. But they were so considerate of one another's feelings. So we have to think about that in the context of, you know, who are we, um, are we, you know, again, not sharing certain things with our spouses, or are we taking these positions that are not really thoughtful about one another's feelings? And this applies to the brothers too. I hope they're watching this, or will watch it at some point. But you know, if your wife asks you not to uh, socialize with certain people, it's respect that you honor that request, and vice versa. And I think we just have to, you know, uh, take take that, uh, you know, nasiha from this. But she prioritized her husband's feelings in that incident. And then quickly, because I know we have, um, oh sure, thank you, Jazakallah Khairan, Ustada Fadu Mashal, she's awesome. She reminded me to define the word ghayra. Ghayra is a type of jealousy, but it is a, a beautiful jealousy, right? It's feeling that, you know, you're, uh, to want to protect the honor of, of something or someone. So that's what, what that word means. I mean, it applied to the story before. But she had uh, immense ghayra and she was known for that. Um, I'm sorry, what, how much time do I have? I just don't want to, just so I know. What is it like? Five, am I done? Five minutes. <laughs> five minutes. Okay. Well, I'll try to finish this up as quickly as I can. Um, it's just she's got so many gems from her story, Subhanallah. But we received two really important hadith from her that warn about ingratitude. So that's why I think she's such a great role model for all of us. She. This is from her own narration. So she reports that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed by a group of women in the mosque one day. We're a group of women. Okay, just imagine this. We're all here, we're remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet walks by and he waves. So beautiful, what, probably with the right hand. <laughs> he waved with his hand to greet them with peace and then he said, this is his nasiha to the women. Beware of ingratitude to those who bless you. Beware of ingratitude to those who bless you. And we know that the Prophet when he repeated something, he was driving a point home. He was trying to penetrate the hearts. And one of the women said, O Messenger of Allah, I seek refuge in Allah, O Prophet of Allah, from being ungrateful to Allah. And you know, she's seeking, like, what, explain. And he says, rather, one of you will be widowed for a long time throughout her middle years. Then Allah provides her with a husband, and he benefits her with a child, the joy of her life. Then she gets very angry, and she swears by Allah, saying, I've never, one good, I've never had one good moment with you. That is ingratitude to the blessings of Allah. That is ingratitude to those who bless her. That's one. And then another hadith, she also narrates that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, spend in charity and do not count it, lest Allah count it against you. Do not hoard it, lest Allah withhold you from you. So we learned, again, her way, according to her son, was that she would just give it away. So she's teaching us, be in a state of gratitude, don't deny blessings, don't magnify incidents, because these are shaitanic you know, thoughts. When you magnify an incident and it overshadows a lifetime or years of experiences, this is what? What is it? Uh, is it Ghafran? No. Uh, thank you. Ghafran and Ni'mah. Thank you. This is ingratitude directly, because shaitan wants you to hyper, uh, again, focus on one thing that was said to you, one thing that was done to you, and that you negate everything else. May Allah protect us from that. We never want to fall under the category of those who are ungrateful. In fact, we want the opposite. We always want, because, you know, the opposite of gratitude is kufr, so may Allah protect us from that. And then to spend in charity and to give away without counting. So this is really great, Nasiha. Sometimes, you know, we are in positions where we might have to give, and if you're the type who is worried about giving away your wealth, this comes from, again, a lack of understanding. May Allah increase us in understanding that never are we losing when we give for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never is it a loss? It is always a gain. It is always an investment. So we want to, you know, really fight, do that mujahid and nafs 
that we give. If, it, if you feel the impulse, just give and don't think twice about it. Don't let that internal conversation have, oh, maybe I'll just do half this time and then I can do it another time. And No. Nafs, shaitan work together to try to, you know, uh, prevent you from getting the maximum reward. So she's teaching us, right? Spend, don't count it, because then Allah will count it against you. And then, finally, and this is what I wanted to end on. Um, I mentioned one incident where she spoke to a tyrant of her time. They call him the Fir'aun of our Ummah, Abu Jahl, right? Um, or I might, I might not have given you the details. Sorry, I, I think I mentioned it, but I didn't get the details. So here's the detail of what happened. Abu Jahl, during the time when the Prophet and Sayyidina Abu Bakr were missing, he stormed into her house and he demanded from her, where are they? Tell me, where are they? And I want you to again imagine, she's a pregnant woman. Pregnant, so vulnerable. There's no protector. Her father is not there. She stands up to him and says, I'm not telling you anything. I don't know anything. He slapped her so hard on her face that her earring fell off. And she still stood firm in front of him. And he realized, I can't get anything out of her, and he left. So that's one incident earlier in her life. At 100 years old, her son, Abdullah ibn Zubair, was uh, executed and crucified by Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf at 100 years old. And right before this incident happened where he was executed, they have this beautiful exchange. Her fa mother and son, he actually goes to her seeking counsel on what to do because he knew that if he fights uh, Al-Hajjaj, he's going to be killed. So he didn't know, should he surrender? Should he fight him? And this is a mother talking to her son, knowing that she's sending him to certain death. And she basically says to him, I would much rather you die a noble death than go and, you know, basically be beholden to this tyrant. So she it gives him this encouragement and this nasiha, and it's this beautiful back and forth. And then he says to her, you know, about being afraid. He's vulnerable. This is his mother. And he says to her, I'm scared about being crucified after death. And she says, skinning a slaughtered goat does not bring it pain. Off you go and seek Allah's help. 100 years old, sending her son to do the right thing. And he, she noticed that he was wearing armor. And he, she said, what, what are you wearing? Take that off. That's not the clothing of someone who's going in to, to martyrdom. You have to stand firm. So she gave her son that encouragement because she knew that that was... You know, his, he, he was already promised Jannah. She knew who, where he was going, and she wanted to give him that, you know, fight, like end his life in, the, in this beautiful way and not to cower to this tyrant. Now, Al-Hajjaj, of course, being who he was, he wanted to um, taunt her. So he did. He taunted her. And he called, he went and sent one of his minions to go get her and said, Come, face me. Uh, you know, what did I do to your son? Basically taunting this 100-year-old woman. And she refused to see him. And then he doubled down and said, if you don't come, I'm going to drag you by your two braids. And again, she was firm and defiant. She's not going to capitulate to him. Finally, he had no choice but to go to her. And, you know, again, he's trying to taunt her. And she says to him something <laughs> so powerful. Remember this. She says, you may have ruined my son's dunya but he has ruined your akhirah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. That is who Asma bint Abi Bakr was. She was an incredible force, a, a loving mother, a devoted wife, daughter, sister-in-law, everything. And she had this life of a hundred years Allah gave her. And now, alhamdulillah, here we are celebrating her life. And inshallah, I'm so honored again to have learned about her life with all of you. And I hope you'll learn more about her and all of the other wonderful sahabiyat and women around our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as we usher in this Mubarak month of Rabi al-Awwal. Jazakumullahu khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakumullahu khairan. Thank you so much. Uh, stand up aside for that beautiful uh, lesson. So, Ustada Maryam Amir, I'm going to reintroduce her just in case you came in late or 
Um, you didn't get to hear her beautiful Quran recitation. She received her master's degree in education from UCLA, and she holds a second degree in Islamic studies through Al-Azhar University. She studied in Egypt, memorized the Quran, and researched a variety of religious sciences uh, for over, over the past 15 years. She has done so much to benefit the Ummah, but my favorite thing to talk about is the Qariya app, mashallah, that she has launched with her team. Um, all female reciters, amazing, amazing app that where you can just listen to female reciters, any surah. It's a free app. You can download on now Android and Apple, right? And so that's really exciting. Um, she has a, a, you can't mess with her. So if she says takbir, you have to say Allahu Akbar because she has a black, second degree black belt, you know? So, you know, <laughs> Allahu Akbar. <laughs> So when she says takbir, you better say Allahu Akbar back, right? <laughs> MashaAllah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah kathiran tayyiban mubarakan fiyah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. When the Muslims believed in the revelation, so many of the Quraysh began to persecute them. And we heard about the persecution of the very first martyr, Sumayya radiallahu anha, from our beloved Ustayd of Husayna. And there were other men and women who were persecuted. For example, Um Shuraik, radiallahu anha. She and her husband accepted Islam. And when her husband was away, her in-laws came. And they asked her whether or not she had actually converted. And when she affirmed, her in-laws carried her out of her home on their shoulders, basically kidnapped her, took her, and force-fed her bread and honey, and then would not allow her to have any water. So you can imagine how dry her mouth felt and her throat. And then they left her in the desert sun for three days. And when they did so, and they came back three days later, she had lost her sight. And they asked her, does she still believe in Allah? Does she still believe that there's only one God? And the way that she responded was still one finger up to the sky in affirmation of this belief. This persecution was so intense that we know that there was a migration from Mecca to Abyssinia. And we also likely have heard of when the Muslims stood in front of a Najashi and Ja'far, the son of Abu Talib, stood and responded to an Najashi's questions on why they were here because the Quraysh had sent people to follow them to Abyssinia to get them back. And when Ja'far stood and he explained how the Prophet took them from the darknesses to the light, the way that they used to harm people and hurt people and didn't take their responsibilities towards people seriously. And then he recited the beginning of Surah Maryam. He said, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim, Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Can you say it to me again? قَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي وَهَنَ الْعَظْمُ مِنِّي وَاشْتَعَلَ الرَّأْسُ شَيْبًا وَلَمْ أَكُمْ بِدْعَائِكَ رَبِّ شَقِيًّا وَإِنِّي خِفْتُ الْمَوَالِيَ مِنْ وَرَائِي وَكَانَتِ امْرَأَتِي عَاقِرًا فَهَبْ لِي he continued to recite the surah as Um Salama explained. The narrator of this hadith is Um Salama radiallahu anha. Have you heard of this narration before? This incident? Have you heard of Ja'far radiallahu anhu going to Abyssinia and speaking in front of a Najashi? Did you know that Um Salama is the one who narrated it? A woman was the one who told us of this incident, and we wouldn't have known about it if she hadn't. And with Ja'far and the Muslims in Abyssinia, 
were over 20 women who had migrated from Mecca to Abyssinia. Some of them didn't have any, any animal to ride on because they couldn't afford it. So walking and riding on animals, they went through the desert onto a ship. None of them had gone on a ship before. Now they're going on ship, they're going to Abyssinia, and this is where they stay for some time. Esma Ziada, who is a scholar who wrote the book, the, the, political role, the Political Roles of Women in the Time of the Prophet وسلم, and the Righteous Khulafa, she speaks about how when she did research on more contemporary historians, when we look at the narrations that they include, they include narrations like Ja'far anhu speaking. They speak about his life anhu. But it's not simply that they mention, for example, and his wife, but don't mention the name. It's that they simply don't mention women at all. And that this is such a stark contrast from the earlier books of history, like Ibn Sa'd's Al-Tabaqat or Ibn Hajr or, um, or uh, Ibn Hisham, that these books talk about the roles of women and the presence of women and the way that women impacted society. And yet, over time, that's shifted. So that many of us today maybe have asked, where really have been women in Islamic society? What are really women's roles or contributions? Especially when we keep hearing that there's really only one role that women play in our community. And this isn't to say that all history books right now omit women or that they were intentional in doing so. But the point is there's been a shift of culture even in the books that have been written. And so when a young woman like myself when I was younger, like many of you when you've been younger or maybe now, are going to the masjid and you're not hearing about any of the women companions, sometimes we wonder, well, did they even exist? I remember feeling so connected to Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu, fighting battles on behalf of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the izzah of Islam. Or Bilal radiallahu anhu, and he would give the adhan in the powerful way that he would give the adhan. Or Ibn Abbas and how he knew the tafsir of the Qur'an and I felt so connected to all of these companions. Radiallahu anhum. But when I would hear Aisha radiallahu anha, or Khadija radiallahu anha, or Fatima radiallahu anha, of course I knew, I believed in the, 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 in the immense iman and the sacrifices of these women, but did I feel connected to them? Not really. And the reason was because I have a more extroverted personality. And the only way that women were presented, not alhamdulillah by my parents, may Allah bless my parents and my family and all of your parents and families, but in Muslim spaces was often that Khadija radiallahu anha was a supportive wife, which she was. That Fatima radiallahu anha was a supportive daughter and mother, which she was. And Aisha radiallahu anha was a scholar with immense modesty, which she was. But that was all. And to not know their personalities, to not know how they interacted in society, to not understand the roles that they played, made it difficult for me to understand how I can follow their example here in my society with the personality that I have, which I continue to struggle with until this day, thanks to the wonderful Muslim community that I love so much. May Allah bless us all. And I mean that sincerely. May Allah truly bless us all. But I keep hearing this from young women. I keep hearing this from little girls. And the fact that it's still an issue breaks my heart. That so many of us grew up hating ourselves for no reason, literally no reason, other than we were told we were not modest enough for existing. And when we look at Asma bint Umais, anha, she gives us permission in her example to play so many different roles in society and in our homes. Asma bint Umais anha, was the wife of Ja'far, the one who gave that speech to Najashi. The Prophet وسلم, in an earlier time when the Quraysh were dealing with a lot of difficulty without food and Abu Talib, when he had multiple sons to care for, the Prophet وسلم, went to his uncle Abbas and suggested that they both take some of the sons and kind of care for them in their home. And so Ali radiallahu anhu went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be cared for in the home, financially supported and cared for. And Ja'far radiallahu anhu went to the home of, Ibn, of Abbas radiallahu anhu. Abbas was married 
to Lubaba, who inshallah Sayyid Amin is going to speak about, Um al-Fadl. And her sister is Asma bint Umais, radiallahu anha. Other sisters of Asma bint Umais are Maymuna, who became a mother of the believers, Salma, who was married to Hamza, radiallahu anhuma, and Asma, she's the fourth one. And so she marries Jafar when they're young. And women played a political role in the society of the Prophet ﷺ because she was amongst the very first ones to give bay'ah to the Prophet ﷺ. This is a political act. And then she seeks political asylum in Abyssinia, a political act. And when she is in Abyssinia, growing the community, she had three sons there, along with the small, Muslim, small group of Muslims who were there. All of them were part of the Abyssinian society, impacting the society. And an Najashi became Muslim while they were there, radiallahu anh. They stayed there for 10 years. And they impacted the way that Islam began to spread in that part of the world. When finally, it was time for them to make hijrah to Medina, subhanAllah, and Najashi sees them go onto the boat and he's giving them his goodbye. And he says, give my salam to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And one of the women narrates and she says, I got to give a Najashi salam to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So now they come to Medina. They've made a hijrah from Abyssinia, from Mecca to Abyssinia, and now from Abyssinia to Medina. And when they are in Medina, people are speaking about them. They're speaking about how these people of the boat didn't make, they're not really considered migrants. They're not really considered like the, the migrants that came to Medina from Mecca. And so, Asma radiallahu anha, one time, she is sitting in a room with Hafsa radiallahu anha. And Hafsa, is the wife of the Prophet وسلم, and the daughter of Umar and so Umar walks in and he sees a woman he doesn't recognize and so he asks his daughter who is this and she replies and says this is Asma bint Umais and so Umar says oh this is the, the, the one from Abyssinia the one who was on the boat I love the shift in narration here because initially it's Umar speaking to Hafsa Oh, th this one is the one. And then Asma responds and she's like, yes. She takes on the, the conversation. And so, <laughs> and we love him so much and he's a person of par promised paradise. And so he speaks to her and he says, we got to Medina before you. Therefore, we have more of a right to the Prophet than you do. And this narration is in Bukhari. Asma radiallahu anha, when she hears this, فغضبت, she got angry. And then she responded to Umar radiallahu anhu. And when she responded, she didn't say, you're right, you are Umar radiallahu I, I, I have nothing to say in front of such a great man, which she could have 100% said and would have been 100% true. Radiallahu anhuma. She didn't say, well, I'm a woman, and so I shouldn't speak in front of a man. Maybe I should go speak to another man to speak to Umar anhu, like maybe have Jafar speak to Umar anhu. She became angry, and she responded to Umar anhu, and she said to him that they had been there with the Prophet wasallam, teaching them and feeding them and helping them and mentoring them, and this is a summary of the hadith. And they were far away. And she's like, I swear I'm not going to eat and I'm not going to drink. I'm going to go to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I'm going to tell him what you said. And so she goes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she expresses the conversation with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he gives her the glad tidings that to Umar and his companions, there's not more of a right of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to them than to her and her companions. They made hijrah one time. But Asma and her companions made hijrah twice. This narration was so beloved to the community 
of the migrants from Abyssinia. The Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, who is a great companion of the Prophet and the group who came with her, kept coming back and asking her to say the narration over and over again because it made them feel so honored. Also note that the conversation before this narration took place was about how they hadn't been really considered immigrants. That was a cultural conversation happening in the community. Asma anha, by speaking up, changed that narrative to then become amongst the highest, the elevated spiritual status to have made hijrah twice with the community. When we use our voice as women, we may not see the outcome in our lifetime, but we help shift cultural narrative. And that's why your voice is so critical for our community, just like Asma' radiallahu anha teaches us. Ja'far radiallahu anhu was sent as a flag bearer, as a leader, in the Battle of Mu'tah. And after Zayd ibn al-Haritha was martyred, Ja'far radiallahu anhu was martyred. This was about a year or less from the time they came from Abyssinia into Medina. And so the Prophet وسلم, who it was said, Ja'far anhu looked the most like him. This is his cousin. He was so happy when Ja'far came from Abyssinia that he said he wasn't, he wasn't sure what made him happier. The fact that he's seeing Ja'far or the fact that they had won the battle of Khaybar that day. And so when the Prophet وسلم, is informed of the passing of Ja'far or knows about the, ja the passing of Ja'far he was known as Ja'far al-Tayyar. Al-Tayyar because he lost both of his arms. And so now he doesn't need the arms of us to move. Inshallah, he is considered a martyr in paradise. When the Prophet ﷺ came to the house of Asma, anha, he was emotional and he was overwhelmed as he was hugging and kissing her three boys. And so she asked him, she was afraid to ask him about the news because there might have been news about Ja'far When he confirmed her husband's martyrdom, she was overcome with emotion, just like the Prophet ﷺ was overcome with emotion. And in this moment, subhanAllah, while the Prophet ﷺ is affirming the immense loss to the community and his immense personal loss while he is seeing her children and so saddened by the fact that they are now an orphan. While he said to Fatima radiallahu anha that this is a, or, or a summary of what was said that this is certainly a day to be sad, someone to really cry over. He informs Asma radiallahu anha not to scream and tear her clothes. This is such an interesting point. Have you ever heard that women should not go to the grave? Have you ever, have, raise your hand if you have never been to the grave, to a graveyard, to a cemetery. Raise it really high, let's look around. Women who've never been to a graveyard or cemetery. Okay, raise your hand if you've been told women shouldn't go to the graveyard or to the cemetery. Okay, raise your hand if you have been told you shouldn't even pray the janazah. All right. In the beginning, in Mecca, the companions, radiallahu anhum, were new in their belief. They were still following or, or learning, still learning about Islam and about the cultural practices that they used to practice not being appropriate anymore. One of those practices was going to the grave, and when they were at the grave, they would call out to the dead. One, is they would praise them to the point of almost worship. Two, they would take them as intercessors between them and Allah. Three, they would hire people. Part of their custom was to hire people and specifically women to come to the grave and to basically build up the personality of the person who died. So they could pay someone, a person could pay someone before they died or pay women specifically because this was especially a part of the pre-Islamic women's culture 
to go to the grave and to be the hype people of this dead person so that the people still living could be like, wow, all the living come from that family? They would become arrogant about who had passed away. So the Prophet ﷺ forbid men and women from going to the grave to protect them from falling into these practices that could lead to calling out to the dead instead of Allah. Once their hearts were firm, once Iman had been strengthened in their hearts, then the Prophet ﷺ changed that ruling and instead ordered and recommended that the believers, men and women, go to the grave, go to the cemetery, because it's an opportunity to remember how short life is. It's an opportunity to think about our own lives and how we are going to live when we're here. And it's an opportunity for grief, to process grief, to realize that Allah is the only one who is really with us in these moments. And this is why there's a specific narration of the Prophet ﷺ cursing women who frequent graves, going day and night every single day, day and night every single day, obsessively going and not doing anything else and not being able to focus on other things in life, including the responsibility upon your own body. Why? Because this was a practice that was especially common amongst women that included ripping their clothing and screaming. Asma radiallahu anha had been in Abyssinia. So she had not been in Medina. She had not been in Mecca for many years in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was teaching fiqh. So in this moment, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, despite the fact that he has lost his own cousin whom he loves so much after being apart from him for 10 plus years, despite the fact that he has so much mercy for his, uh, th these new orphans, that he is crying and overwhelmed with emotion, despite the fact that he says to the people of Medina to cook food for Asma and her family so that she doesn't have to take worry about that in this moment. She can focus on her family, her children, and her grief. The Prophet ﷺ respectfully, kindly, lovingly teaches her fiqh. Have you ever been taught fiqh in such a way, in such a moment? Or have you been in the midst of your grief and because you are a woman have been told you cannot even cry this person that you love is going to hear you crying and they're going to be punished. The immense pain that women experience sometimes in even the biggest spaces of pain is a testament to the strength of your faith. We ask Allah to make us sincere and give us the bat and I didn't give you so many references in what I just mentioned because of the shortness of the time. That discussion is literally an entire hour. But alhamdulillah, I just finished writing a manuscript for a book addressing all these issues related to women. And inshallah, all the sources are going to be in there inshallah in two years when it's published. So, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, inshallah in one year, inshallah. But the point is that we have Turat, we have so much, so much scholarship that has addressed this and why it is and the way it is and the context. Has any of that context been even ever mentioned to any of you when it's been told women shouldn't go to the grave? Where is the context? Context is so critical. Because if we only take one statement, then we can say, oh, the Prophet ﷺ just said this to Asma anha in her pain. We don't know that he was in pain. We don't know that he went to love and support her family, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. After Ja'far radiallahu anhu passed away, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu lost his wife, Umm Rumman, the mother of Aisha radiallahu anha. And after the idda of Asma radiallahu anha, Abu Bakr and Asma radiallahu anha got married. And so now she marries Tabarakallah Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And she's pregnant. And they go to make hajj while she's pregnant. And guess what happens? She gives birth on their way to hajj. And so now Abu Bakr anhu asks the Prophet وسلم, like, what should she do? She's in Nifas now. She is bleeding a particular type of blood that we're not supposed to do salah in. And they're going for hajj. And in Umrah or hajj, there are parts that you need to be in wudu. So what should she do? The Prophet ﷺ doesn't say, oh, she should turn back, or we should stay here, and no one should go. Or The Prophet ﷺ just teaches the fiqh of what to do, 
and she continues on the way and makes Hajj, the farewell Hajj with the Prophet ﷺ. The same Hajj in which Aisha radiallahu anha also got her period, and that she shared the fact that she had gotten her period. And now all of the Muslims until the end of time know that Asma radiallahu anha was in postpartum bleeding during Hajj, and that Aisha radiallahu anha was in her period during Hajj, so that all of us women today, when Allah has honored us, with something that's so critical for the continuation of humanity that we do not feel like it's something terrible, like it's a punishment from Allah, like it's something that we need to be ashamed of because it's a natural part of our bodies that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with and we can still go for hajj and umrah even in this state. What a mercy from Allah that he has given these women as examples to us. That we have, because of their modesty, because of their modesty, we know these stories. Because their modesty meant commitment to Allah. And what better commitment than being so clear about what's happening to you that you can help other women centuries later. When Fatima radiallahu anha was very sick and passing away, Asma radiallahu anha was taking care of her. And as she was taking care of her, Fatima told her that she doesn't like the fact that when a woman passes away, or when she passes away, that the burial shroud kind of shows the shape of her body. And so Asma had seen in Abyssinia that they would build with sticks and with different pieces of nature, kind of like a, like a, not a coffin, but something that would hold the body when it's being delivered from the janazah to the, to the grave. So as Fatima radiallahu anha asked to see what that looked like. And so Asma radiallahu anha built it for her. Fatima saw it, she liked it. And when Fatima passed away, she was taken in this, uh, coffin like box and that was how her body was transported radiyallahu anha and it was from asma radiyallahu anha seeing that in abyssinia and then sharing that with fatima radiyallahu anha but also let's let's take a minute to consider that fatima radiyallahu anha is passing away and her concern is that the shape of her body is going to be noticed after she dies radiyallahu anha Yes, we have an obsession about speaking about modesty in our community sometimes, and may Allah bless our community and help us, you know, feel loved in every way. But also on the same end, we speak about hijab in ways that sometimes women in our community feel so hypersexualized that we don't even feel comfortable being women in Muslim spaces completely covered because of the hypersexualization of women in our community. Fatima radiallahu anha, her concern was in connection to Allah. It wasn't a political act. It wasn't about, a, it, it wasn't about a, when sometimes we speak about hijab and we say, oh, you know, uh, don't be obsessed with the dunya. It wasn't, it was worship. That's all it was. It was worship for her. And as a community, we need to step back, especially considering globally, and consider, are we building the identity of our sisters, helping our sisters feel connected? Because hijab was not revealed until at least 14 years after the beginning of the revelation. Do all of us have 14 years of mentorship by someone like the Prophet wasallam, where the focus is building our iman and building our individualized personalities and ourselves and our connection and the importance of our contribution before we obsessively speak about hijab? Fatima radiallahu anha saw this as an act of worship, as it is. And so when Asma radiallahu anha is taking care of her body, she was one of three who washed the body of Fatima radiallahu anha, we can see the honor that she gave to her wishes. After Fatima radiallahu anha passed away, Abu Bakr radiallahu anha passed away. 
And Abu Bakr had stipulated that he wanted Fatima, excuse me, excuse me, Asma to wash his body, not his sons, not Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr, the son between Asma and Abu Bakr, or any of his other children, Asma radiallahu anha. She washed the body of the first caliph of Islam, one of the, the best, the, the, the most righteous companion, radiallahu anha. And after she had washed his body, she came out and she said, today I am fasting and it is a very cold day. Do I need to make a ghusl because I made a ghusl for the person who passed away? And there are two narrations. One says she spoke to a group of muhajirun. Another said she spoke to Uthman radiallahu anhu and Umar radiallahu anhu overheard. And they said, no, you don't. She washed the body of her husband. She's in immense grief. And she says she's fasting. And she's wondering, does she need to make ghusl despite the fact that she's exhausted and she's emotionally overwhelmed? And it's a freezing cold day. Does she still need to make ghusl? The fact that she's considering these issues shows to us that we can be focused on the technicalities of how to practice while still fully embracing all aspects of our pain and our joy and our personalities and who we are internally and externally. She marries Ali radiallahu anhu after Abu Bakr radiallahu And one day her son Muhammad, the son of Ja'far, gets into an argument with her other son Muhammad, the son of Abu Bakr. And she has two sons with Ali radiallahu anhum. And so they get into an argument and what is like, my father was better than your father. And the other one says, my father is better than your father. And so what does she, Ali radiallahu anhu say? He says, what did you say to her? And she says, I told them that Ja'far was the best of the youth and that Abu Bakr was the best of the elders. And Ali said, to summarize, he was like, would you leave for me? Radiallahu <laughs> anhum. In Asma radiallahu anha, we also see that when she is in grief, subhanAllah, she's still narrating hadith, that she's gone through so much in her life, but she doesn't compromise on who she is. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught her a dua, or she narrated a dua. And this dua that she narrated, when you say it, when you're afflicted with sadness or depression, when you make this dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will lift it from you. And that dua is, Allahu Rabbi, Allahu Rabbi, la sharika lah. My Lord, Allah is my Lord, my caretaker, my nurturer. And there's no one worthy of worship with him. Allahu Rabbi, la sharika lah. And I'd like to add and say that when you make this dua, if you're going through depression or anxiety, or you are having thoughts of unaliving or anything related, also seek therapy. Because the Prophet ﷺ was there as a mentor. He was there as emotional support for the companions he was teaching du'as to. He himself ﷺ sought support from Umm Salama radiallahu anha, from Khadija radiallahu anha. We have specific narrations of this. So when the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us about du'as that we can say to help us through those times of emotion, it doesn't mean only say this dua and all of a sudden everything's great. Make this dua and also seek support. Maristan is right here. May Allah bless Dr. Rania and all those involved in trying to support the emotional, overwhelming experience, emotionally overwhelming experiences that many of us may experience. Finally, Asma radiallahu anha teaches us that like the woman companions, we can be shy or we can be extremely bold. We can be extroverts or introverts or someone in between or a mix of it. We can be housewives and stay at home moms or we can work or we can be a mix of all. But no matter what, we have a role to play. You were created in this time period, in this space, in this land for a reason. 
Allah placed you here intentionally. You're not a random person that was born and that's going to die. You are here for a reason. Whether that means you are here to support the next generation of children and grandchildren with the most healing love you can share so that inshallah we can work towards a healed ummah. Or whether that means you are building an institution or working or whatever it means. You have a role to play. And in Asma radiallahu anha, we see that even, unfortunately, when we speak about women, we actively consider her relationship status as what gives her worth. And yet, whether a woman is a divorced or a widow or has always been single or married three times, like Asma radiallahu anha, you have worth because of who you are as a believer. You have worth because of who you are in connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how you use any of those relationships in your life to come closer to him and to help others come back to him. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdik nashadu wa na ilaha ila adna astaghfirka wa natubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khairan. Thank you so much, Ustada Maryam Amira. So I have the honor to continue this program today introducing somebody I actually had never heard until she was invited to speak at the Womanhood Conference, the, uh, the first one. So I had never met uh, Dr. Amina Darwish. I didn't know who she was. I'd never heard her speak. And then when I heard her, I fell in love. It was like instant, mashallah. She's very sweet and very knowledgeable, very passionate about her work. She started uh, as the Associate Dean of Religious and Spiritual Life and Advisor for, the Muslim, for Muslim Life in February 2021. She served as the first full-time Muslim Life Coordinator at Columbia. Dr. Dadwish has a decade of professional experience working with the Muslim community. She also brings years of experience building and serving in nonprofit organizations, she brings a unique blend of understanding of different cultures within the Muslim community while staying grounded in traditional Islamic scholarship. She earned her PhD in chemical engineering before switching careers to follow her true passion for community building. She remain, <coughs> remains passionate about uh, uh, she remains passionate about ethics and meaning and service in the STEM disciplines. She strives to create a culture of openness and consistent kindness in the community she serves. She earned Ijazas, traditional Islamic studies certifications from the uh, Al Qalam and critical loyalty, critical loyalty seminaries, including an Ijazah in the Ten Qiraat. Dr. Darwish has studied individually under different scholars from different parts of the world and has uh, taught college level coursework on Islam and Muslims, and she's currently serving at Stanford. So I welcome uh, Dr. Amina Darwish. InshaAllah. Alright, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salat salam ala ashrul musayin rabbi shahni sadi wa sirli amri wa hlul aqdata min lisani yafqahu qawli In the name of Allah, the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy and prayers and blessings be on his beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam The companion that I get to talk about today, alhamdulillah, is a woman by the name of Lubaba bint al-Harith radiallahu anha So I'm just gonna like talk about her name for a second So Lub is, is that the, the essence or the core of something and I remember as a child, any time my mom would, I would be doing something, and my mom wants me to stop, she'd shoot me this look. And she would quote this line to me, and it says, <laughs> Certainly the person with intellect, with lub, with a core that is grounded, can understand from just a sign. And I knew that that meant that I was going to stop doing whatever I was doing. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. It's funny, my brother at some point called, and he's like, you know how mama would like just look at us and just stop? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, I stared at my son. He stared right back. I don't think I'm doing it right, man. And I'm like, no, dude, I don't think you're doing it right. Like, do we, what do we do? Like, practice in the mirror? Like, trying to figure out how to do it just right? Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. May Allah reward my mom, alhamdulillah, and everyone's mom. Alhamdulillah. So Lubaba bint al-Harith, her, her kunya was Umm al-Fadl. And this is not something that we really do right now, but it's like you're... I don't want to say your stage name because it wasn't a stage, but it was, this is what she was known for. And it was because her eldest son was named Al-Fadl, and she was known as Umm Al-Fadl, the mother of Al-Fadl. But in the Arabic language, when you would call someone Umm something or Abu something, you're actually also attributing more to them than that. And she is so deserving of this. So Fadl is, is more than just, it's a form of excellence. 
Like when we say Fadlullah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fadl on us. It's not like your needs are met. It's your needs are met and then so much more. It's someone that is so generous, giving from such an endless bounty. That's what fadl means. It's one of the higher, highest levels of excellence, subhanAllah. And her eldest son was named Al-Fadl, and so she was known as Umm Al-Fadl, the mother of Al-Fadl. Also, she was Umm Al-Fadl not just as, as a mother to her son, but also in terms of her character, radiallahu anha. So the first thing I want you to know about her is that she was Khadija, radiallahu anha's best friend. Which, I mean, subhanAllah, the Prophet, sallallahu says, Mbada ala dini khalila. The person is with a... With, you, you have the same religion as your khalil. And the word khalil, it actually has the same word, word as khilla, as deficiency. That when this person's missing, you feel like something's wrong. Right? You know how you, like, you do something, you're like, who am I going to call? And then the first person you call. So she was Khadija radiallahu anha's best friend. And what an incredible best friend. So based on her narration, she said, I took my shahada the same day as Khadija radiallahu anha. Who was, who was the first person to become Muslim? Khadija radiallahu anha, that's completely agreed upon. There is zero dispute over who the first Muslim was. It was Khadija radiallahu anha. And she's saying, I took my shahada the first same day as my friend Khadija radiallahu anha. So by all accounts, she is the second woman to become Muslim. And then we don't know, was there any of the men that became Muslim before her or not? We don't actually know. So she could have been the second Muslim outside of the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi of course, just period. When we say the first and the second, we don't mean like, of course, his daughter Fatima radiallahu anha, his daughter Ruqayya, Zainab, and Um Kuthum radiallahu anhu, the, the people in his, the household of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi Subhanallah. But outside of the house of the Prophet sallallahu she was the second woman to ever become, she was, became Muslim after her friend Khadija radiallahu anha. Her husband, Abbas radiallahu anhu, was the Prophet sallallahu uncle. He was three years older than the Prophet sallallahu And if those are your family friends, you know how you get married and you have couple friends? <laughs> These were their couple friends. <laughs> they had kids that were of similar age. They were just, subhanAllah, really, really, really close friends. My, one of my closest friends, she used to live right next door to me. We used to drink coffee together every morning. Like, we were friends' friends. And some of the narrations about her, the Prophet Sallallahu used to go visit her and used to take naps at her house. That's how close they were. Like, my friend, I go drink coffee at her house. I'm like, oh, I have to do this. I'm just going to sit on your couch. I'm going to take a nap for like 20 minutes and I'm going to get up. I live next door. Like, I don't need to nap on her couch. <laughs> but I felt comfortable enough napping on her couch, subhanAllah. And you can imagine the Prophet Sallallahu doing this in the house of Umm al-Fadr radiallahu anha. In the house of his uncle Abbas radiallahu anhu, who was only actually only three years older than him. Al Abbas radiallahu anhu was tasked with as siqaya wal imara al hujjaj. So when people would come to Mecca from all these different places intending to visit the Kaaba, Al Abbas radiallahu anhu was actually responsible for giving them water. And they would give them water from the well of Zamzam. Where, does anyone know where we got the word Zamzam? Yes, someone said yes. Who came up with the name? Hajar alayhi salam. So we know the story of how she was making du'a, she was going back and forth between the Safa and the Marwa, and she's making all this du'a, and she's working really hard, and every time someone goes to Hajar Umrah, they follow in the footsteps of our mother, Hajar alayhi salam. I'm not saying this just because I'm Egyptian, but she is from the land of the Nile. Allah, <laughs> our mother, Hajar alayhi salam. But the reason that's significant is when the water started gushing out and people started, she tried to collect it and she kept saying, zummi, zummi, collect, collect. This is where we got the word, zamzam. And the other tribes came in and they said, we want a portion of the water. She says, yes, but I manage it. Because none of you know how to manage a water resource. I'm from the land of the Nile. I know how to manage a water resource. And when we think of Lubaba radiallahu anha, she is the inheritor of our mother Hajar alayhi salam. She's best friends with Khadija radiallahu anha, but also in this role, an inheritor of our foremother. SubhanAllah. So something that's, I just wanted, wanted to stop for a second, just talking about Mecca. Mecca was the city of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and Ibrahim alayhi salam. Neither one of them is actually buried in Mecca. Ibrahim alayhi salam is buried in Khalil in Palestine, and the Prophet sallallahu is often buried in Medina. The two people that are actually buried in Mecca that are holding down the fort are actually our mothers, Hajar alayhi salam and Khadija radiallahu anha. So the amount of loyalty that Lubaba radiallahu anha had to her friend Khadija 
was so incredible. And every time I think of her, I think of Baraka radiallahu anha, who inshallah Dr. Rania will talk about next. She was friends with Amina and continued on being a mother to the Prophet ﷺ long after Amina radiallahu anha passed. And Lubaba radiallahu anha, if you can imagine the role Khadija radiallahu anha had. After her friend passed away, that was the role that she took on to honor her friend Khadija radiallahu anha being a mother to the Ummah. We think of the Prophet ﷺ as the father to the Ummah, and Ummahat al Mu'mineen, the mothers of the believers, are the mothers of the Ummah. And they carried us through after the passing of the Prophet ﷺ. When you lose a parent, you rely on the other. We relied on the mothers of the believers. And Lubaba has served a similar role to her, her best friend Khadija. So I just, subhanAllah. Um, sorry, Sister Ustadha um, Maryam, Afwan, Ustadha Maryam had mentioned this where she was talking about some of her in laws. And there is a narration, Wallahu Alam, it's not a strong narration, but it's still a narration where the Prophet ﷺ says, Al Akhawat al Mu'minat, the believing sisters. And he lists them. He says, Maymuna, Zawjat al Nabi ﷺ, Maymuna, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, her sister Umm al Fadl, so Maymuna and Umm al Fadl actually shared both parents. And then the other two sisters, Asma and Salma, the wife of, uh, um, excuse me, Asma bint Umais, anha, who Maryam had just spoke about, and her sister, Salma bint Umais, who were actually, um, they shared a, a mother, but didn't share a father with Umm al-Fadl, Lubaba anha. So they were half-sisters. SubhanAllah. I just want to add that it doesn't actually end there. Because they had an, she had another half-sister, Zainab, anha, who actually married the Prophet ﷺ in the third year of the Hijrah and passed away within a few months. Zainab bint Khuzayma. Anha. So she has two sisters who married the Prophet ﷺ, a half-sister and a full sister, subhanAllah. Um, the other person, she also had a younger sister named Lubaba, Lubaba Sughra, so they, they loved the name so much, they said Lubaba the older and Lubaba the younger. Lubaba the younger was actually the mother of Khan Walid. And you're seeing, you're hearing all these family connections. SubhanAllah. Those four sisters are actually part of what bound all of these leaders of Mecca together. If you think of sisterhood, we should be thinking of these four women. SubhanAllah. And part of what's fascinating about sisterhood is that women, in general, the way that women lead is very different from how men lead. For the men to lead, you have to have one person standing at the front and it's clear this is the person leading. With women, the leader actually stands in the middle. I remember the first time I had to lead Salah and I was so scared. My friend's like, oh, I'm going to support you. I'm like, how are you going to support me? Like, either you're leading or I'm leading. And she's like, I'll stand next to you. I'm like, okay, that's, that is true. In addition, she says, have gambik, which also means like, I'll support you. But I'm like, it literally means I'm just going to stand next to you. And I'm like, well, cool. I'm doing that. She did stand next to me. It was very helpful. Because this is how women lead, subhanAllah. And they're raising this generation of people together. So Lubaba radiallahu anha became Muslim all the way at the beginning. And we know from the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu there were three years that they were doing da'wah, the Prophet sallallahu was doing da'wah in secret. And she is someone that had to keep that secret for a long time. Her husband al-Abbas did not become Muslim until years later. SubhanAllah. He was actually one of the only two of the uncles of the Prophet sallallahu who became Muslim, Hamza and al-Abbas radiallahu anhu. Subhanallah. And subhanallah that these two sisters were married to those brothers. Subhanallah. So Lubaba radiallahu anha becomes Muslim within the first year of the of the ba'th of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi within the first year of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi receiving revelation. And then three years in, the Prophet sallallahu receives a command from, the, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It says, وَإِنذَرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ And warn your closest family. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi hosts a family gathering at his house. He invites all of them over. And they all have this huge meal. And right as he is about to talk, mind you, the Prophet ﷺ has spoken to his family members before. They know what he's talking about. And there's one person in particular, one of his uncles, Abu Lahab, who before this point had been very supportive of the Prophet ﷺ. He loved the Prophet ﷺ. He's actually the one who paid for his aqiqah. You know when the child is born and someone donates the animal and has the dinner and all. Like Abu Lahab actually did that. And initially when the Prophet ﷺ told him about Islam, he actually is like, yeah, this is a cool thing. And then he looked, and in an enslaved man, he said, me and him will be equal. I don't want what you're selling. 
Imagine how hurtful that is. It was really, it was literally his arrogance that got him. May Allah protect us from arrogance. And may Allah protect us from ever looking at another human being and saying, I'm better than them. Because that destroyed Abu Lahab. The Prophet ﷺ invites everyone over. Before he can get a word out, Abu Lahab stands up. He says, if we don't stop him, all of the Arabs are going to fight us. And he ruins the Prophet ﷺ's dinner. The Prophet ﷺ lets them all go home. He calls another dinner. Lubaba radiallahu anha is there. Abbas radiallahu anha is there. She's part of the family. She's probably helping her friend Khadija radiallahu anha. She's her best friend. Every time my best friend hosted a huge dinner, I was there cooking with her. This is what your friends do. They had another one. Everyone comes over before they finish the meal to preempt Abu Lahab. The Prophet ﷺ starts calling to his family. He tells them, if I'm going to lie to anyone, I wouldn't lie to you. You're my people. You're my family. And subhanAllah, Abbas he turned away. He didn't assault the Prophet ﷺ, but he wasn't ready. And we know this famous moment where Ali radiallahu he says, I, I, I'm going to do it. He was 10 years old. <sighs> SubhanAllah, we talked about Asma'a radiallahu anha converting when she was 11. How many, how many people, young people in our community be like, oh, what do they know? Oh, what did Ali radiallahu know? Again, don't be the person that dismisses Ali radiallahu May Allah protect us from ever being that. But she's there. She's a witness to all of these things. Finally, the Prophet ﷺ stands on the mountain of Safa. He calls out to everyone. And again, Abu Lahab is the one who insults the Prophet ﷺ. And SubhanAllah, he said, he told the Prophet ﷺ, Tabban laka sa'ir al May you be cursed the rest of the day. And the Qur'an was revealed, said, Tabbat yada Abi Lahab bin Watab. May the hands of Abu Lahab become cursed, subhanAllah. May Allah protect us from that. Which, I mean, you insult the Prophet ﷺ. It's a short surah, so like five-year-olds in the Ummah are learning it till the Day of Judgment. <laughs> do not mess with the Prophet. <laughs> like, don't ever do that, subhanAllah. But she's a witness to all of these things, and all of these things are happening in front of her eyes. There are people that have left... SubhanAllah, there was a moment where we know when the Prophet ﷺ was a young child, when after the passing of his mother and the passing of his grandfather, the Prophet ﷺ, his grandfather asked his uncle Abd al-Muttalib to take care of him. And he in fact lived in the house of Abd al-Muttalib. And then at some point Abd al-Muttalib became so overwhelmed, he had ten children, he couldn't support all of his children. So Al-Abbas and the Prophet ﷺ said, let's take some of his children, and take care of all of their needs and all of their finances. And that's actually how Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anh, ended up in the house of the Prophet Ja'far radiallahu anh, we talked about, who was, the white, the, who was married to his wife is Asma radiallahu anh, who Ustadha uh, Maryam talked about, he grew up in the house of Al-Abbas, where Lubaba was a mother to him. He wasn't her biological child, but she raised him in her own house. And we know that Ja'far was the closest person to the Prophet ﷺ in looks and in character. SubhanAllah. This was the Prophet ﷺ telling him this. By the seventh, sixth year since the beginning of the revelation, now at this point, the Prophet ﷺ and his words, the Quran, the, 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 the Quran that he was reciting and the truth that he was giving people became so powerful, they decided they're going to boycott them. And mind you, when they're boycotting them, they're not boycotting the Muslims. The majority of the Muslims, some of the Muslims ran away to, uh, to Abyssinia, modern-day Ethiopia. Some of the Muslims, which subhanAllah, Najash is the first king to ever become Muslim. SubhanAllah. Some of them are hiding their Islam. They can't go anywhere. And then the entire family of the Prophet ﷺ gets forced in the place called Sha'ab Bani Talib. And they were between, like, between the mountains. No one was allowed to trade with them. And the majority of them, I want to point out, were not Muslim. They were standing on principle. They were not actually Muslim. And you can imagine the guilt the Prophet ﷺ is feeling. His entire family is getting pushed out. Can you, like, his uncle made him sleep in a different place every night out of fear that someone would betray him and sell him out from hunger. In the midst of all of this, Lubaba's witnessing her best friend Khadija radiallahu get weaker and weaker. And subhanAllah, everyone's really struggling. And it was actually then that Allah gifted her, her son Abdullah ibn al-Abbas Can you imagine being the person that is bringing this joyous news to the Prophet ﷺ? And I want to point out that her son Abdullah ibn al-Abbas, they call him Hibr hadhi al-Ummah. He's, he is the scholar of the Ummah. Which, I mean, <laughs> wow, he's the scholar of the Ummah. She made dua that Allah gift him knowledge. And he was the one that carried on the legacy of so much of the family of the Prophet ﷺ. 
He carried on the legacy of hadith. There's so many stories about him that when the, uh, he would like the Sahaba, the elder Sahaba, they said, they, they, he said, he realized, he told his friends, he's like, the Sahaba are starting to pass away. I need to go ask them stuff. So he goes sleep in front of their house. The Sahaba, radiallahu he'd open his door in the morning, he'd find Abdullah ibn Abbas like sleeping in front of his door. <laughs> Subhanallah. That was her son, and this is the moment when he was born. Giving hope to the ummah. And when he was born, we talked about this idea of tahniq where you, you, you take the date. They didn't have a date. The Prophet ﷺ took his saliva and he put it inside of the mouth of Abdullah ibn Abbas this newborn child, the son of Lubaba radiallahu anha. Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah, the, 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 the boycott is lifted. The next year is actually called the year of sorrow because Khadija radiallahu anha passes away. And the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ who was protecting him passes away. So two things happened. The protection of the Prophet ﷺ moved on to Al-Abbas, to his other uncle. So again, even though he was not Muslim, he was protecting the Prophet ﷺ. And can you imagine what Lubaba took from her friend Khadija? To continue protecting, she was known when you are stuck in Mecca and you can't get out and you're Muslim and you need help, that Lubaba radiallahu is the person that you go to. And everyone knew this. This is what she was known for, out of loyalty to her friend Khadija radiallahu anha. Subhanallah. When the time of the Hijrah comes, she's Muslim. She can't leave. Her husband's not Muslim. Her Islam is a secret. And even Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anha, he said, my mother and I for were from those who were oppressed in Mecca that couldn't leave. But she was given a task by the Prophet ﷺ to protect everyone else that was stuck in Mecca that also couldn't leave. And she did this with loyalty for years. And it's one thing to be like, mashallah, we talked about the people that went to Abyssinia, they're the people of the two Hijra. Lubaba radiallahu was stuck in Mecca, in the center of it all, watching them raise an army against the Prophet ﷺ. During the Battle of Badr, her, her husband, Abbas, was actually forced into the battle against the Muslims. And she's watching him go to join an army to fight the, the Prophet ﷺ. Like, imagine what she is going through as she's witnessing this. SubhanAllah, the Muslims, we know the Muslims won in Badr. The Meccans had never imagined that. They were undefeated. Badr was such, like, blew everybody's minds. People could not fathom, like, actually, subhanAllah, the Qur'an calls it Yawm al-Furqan. It is the day where, where, where truth has become evident, subhanAllah, in the Battle of Badr. So the Battle of Badr happens. The disbelievers are running back to Mecca. And there's one, only one leader of Mecca that didn't leave with them. He was a coward, and his name is... We talked about him already. Who was the coward that didn't go? Abu Lahab. You paid someone else to go on his behalf. He's like, you owe me a debt? Go, go to this battle. I don't want to go. So he's the only leader of Mecca that didn't go. And, the, and subhanAllah, the, the, the Muslims win such a resounding victory that now there are people that are just running, trickling back into Mecca. It's not a celebratory army that's coming back with a parade or anything. Like People are just running back into Mecca. So they run back into Mecca, and everyone's saying, we lost, we lost. Quraysh is like, wait, what? What are you talking about? And more and more people kept coming in until finally a man came in and, and Abu Lahab held him. He's like, tell me what happened. And he started describing the battle to him. He told him there were these men that were wearing all white. They were on horses that were between the heavens and the earth. He's describing the angels. And he said they would strike someone and, and the wound wouldn't be red, it would be green. And subhanAllah, there was a... There was a um, a mawla, an enslaved man that was living in her house, who was also Muslim. And his Islam was a secret. He started, he couldn't contain himself. He's like, the angels, the angels. Abu Lahab was furious. Took this man, he started to beat him. Like, even the narration said he was literally on top of him, hitting him. And I want you to picture this, because who has power in that moment? Abu Lahab does. Who has the clout and the authority in that moment? Abu Lahab does. And I don't mean to, like, in America, we all know this. If you see an officer standing over a man, beating him, who has the power in that moment? 
how terrifying is it to stand up to that person who clearly has no problem using all of their power and all of their authority to physically harm someone. Luaba anha picked up one of the poles of the tent, which I can't even imagine, like, for the adrenaline that she must be going through her body and the physical strength that she had, she went and she whacked Abu Lahab on the head. That was the only way to get him off. You know when someone's crazed and won't let go? She knew it and she whacked him. Yeah, oh, she is a boss lady. And she told Abu Lahab, you think because Al-Abbas is not here that you can do this to a member of our household? I want you to also understand in that position, she's also a member of Al-Abbas's household. Clearly, Abu Lahab had no problem beating anyone in the house of Al-Abbas. And she took that stand anyway. It's one thing when it's, subhanAllah, because now we watch all these videos. You, unfortunately, there's some horrendous videos that you witness. And there are other wi videos where you see another cop that stood up to a, a cop and said, hey, we're not doing this. This was another person that stood up and said, I'm just as vulnerable as him, and I'm going to stand up for him anyway. Within seven days, Abu Lahab had passed away. Not from that hit, but actually from an infection that he got from it. So even though Lubaba was not part of the Battle of Badr, the remaining leader of Mecca that was fighting the Prophet ﷺ, she's actually the one that got him. And she got him defending another person, subhanAllah. Someone that Mecca had decided was, was vulnerable enough and not worth fighting for, subhanAllah. She stood up and fought them. SubhanAllah. By the third year of the Hijrah, that's the point where her, sis, her half-sister Zainab bint Khuzayma married the Prophet ﷺ after her husband was martyred, and within a few months she passed away. By the fifth year of the Hijrah, all this she's stuck in Mecca. Everybody's like, all this stuff is happening now, Sulh al-Hudaybi, they're coming, they're doing, they're, they're, they're creating this treaty with the Prophet ﷺ. They were coming to do Umrah, they get sent back from their Umrah, they sign the treaty. By the sixth year of the Hijrah, they're doing something called Umrah al-Qadha, where the year after they came back to do their Umrah. During that Umrah, everyone in Mecca emptied out because they didn't even want to witness the Prophet ﷺ coming in all of his glory. They actually start, sorry, I don't know how much time we have. Okay, alhamdulillah. They started this rumor about the Muslims. They're like, oh, they've gotten diseased and now they're sick in Medina and they're not okay. Do you, has anyone, how many people have been to Umrah? Few people. You know that part in the Sa'i where there's like the, the green lights and people run faster? That was the only part that the disbelievers could see them, the, the Muslims doing their Sa'i. So the Prophet ﷺ told them, in this portion, I need you to run faster and that's why we run faster. Of like, oh, you're calling us sick, we're doing our sa'i, and we're running in the sa'i. And they're like, man, they're <laughs> really strong. SubhanAllah. But the Lubaba radiallahu and, and Abbas radiallahu they were still living in Mecca, and her sister Maymuna was actually living in her house until the Prophet ﷺ came and proposed to her, and that's actually where the wedding happened. It happened in those three days in Mecca. And Abbas and Lubaba radiallahu anhum were actually the ones who hosted this wedding, where she is her full sister, Maymuna radiallahu is marrying the Prophet ﷺ, and she was the last woman to actually marry the Prophet ﷺ. She was the last of the mothers of the believers, subhanAllah. In the eighth year of the Hijrah, that's how long it took. Finally, alhamdulillah, Al-Abbas became Muslim. He became Muslim, he took his shahada, he decided to do Hijrah. He is actually counted as the very last muhajir. Because for you to be a muhajir, you have to, you have to take your shahada and go towards the Prophet ﷺ before the conquest of Mecca. He leaves Mecca with the intention of joining the Prophet ﷺ, and lo and behold, the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba are all just outside of Mecca, now coming for the conquest of Mecca. SubhanAllah. So the Prophet ﷺ comes in, they conquer Mecca, and the Prophet ﷺ, there's so many moments, like it wasn't just her, it was her and a few other people, that the Prophet ﷺ, Aisha radiallahu anha asked him, she's like, you sat with these people for a long time, who are they? Like there are some important dignitaries, it's this or it's that. He says, we're remembering the good old days of Khadija. He's coming home to his house where Khadija radiallahu anha was buried. This is now a decade later, this was her friend. And the Prophet ﷺ is just excited to see her. 
subhanAllah, after that moment, she actually, her and Abbas and their whole family actually joins the Prophet Sallallahu in Medina. And he was in those last two years of them, of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu when they're living in Medina that we now get all of the narrations about her and her attractions with the Prophet Sallallahu she narrates, and she narrates actually a few hadith from him, and her son Abdullah ibn Abbas who is known as the narrator of hadith, he actually narrates from his mother, Ulubaba, radiallahu Umm al-Fadl. There are two narrations, one of them that I think is hilarious. So when Al-Husayn radiallahu anhu, the grandson of the Prophet ﷺ was born, Lubaba actually nursed him. So she was a nurse mom to Al-Husayn radiallahu anhu. And she was carrying the baby, and she goes to the visit the Prophet Sallallahu She hands the Hussein Nadiyallahu to the Prophet Sallallahu and this is just funny because it's I don't know human. And then Hussein Nadiyallahu pees all over the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi <laughs> I mean, they're just normal human everyday things. Babies do this. She tells the Prophet Sallallahu you know, if you go change, I can I can wash it for you. This is actually where we get the fiqh ruling, where the Prophet Sallallahu says, for a newborn boy, you can actually just sprinkle water on it. It doesn't ruin your tahara. But for, for if it's a newborn girl, then you actually have to wash the garment. And there's... Yeah, I'm not going to get into the fiqh of that because it's too long. Alhamdulillah. But I just think it's really fascinating. SubhanAllah. Again, it's everyday things. The, the reason we know how to make ghusl is because her sister Maymun is the one that told us. Like, who else is going to watch the Prophet and make ghusl? <laughs> it had to be his wife. <laughs> the narration was from Maymun. That's how we know how to make ghusl. This is the, the value of these women, subhanAllah. She went with the Prophet ﷺ during Hajj al And during, during the Hajj, there were people that were having a discussion. They're like, is the Prophet ﷺ fasting? It's the day of Arafah. Is he fasting? Is he not fasting? What do we do? And she knew he wasn't fasting. But she did something that was very subtle and very smart. She just took some milk, went to the Prophet ﷺ, handed him the bowl. He stopped, he drank the milk in front of everyone, and everyone was like, okay, not fasting. That's how we know that ruling. And the reason I mention how she did it is in that subtlety, we might miss that it was a woman's wisdom that gave us this ruling. No one, when you read the fiqh of Adnan Lubaba has the reason, we don't know, like, she's not necessarily listed in those books, but we know it was her wisdom that did this. Just because we don't know the stories and the women and our mothers and our foremothers that came before us doesn't mean that Allah did not see them. I remember going to my, my teacher, Allah, Arhamu Sheikh Ayyub, and I would get so frustrated about things. He's like, why do you care? Allah knows. I'm like, oh, but Sheikh, someone's taking credit for blah, 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 and I would get so mad. And he's like, why do you care? Allah knows. I need Allah to know. I don't need everybody else to know. I just think it's so beautiful, subhanAllah. There's another, um, how much time do I have? Okay, all right, alhamdulillah. There was one of my favorite narrations from the time where the Prophet, because part of this is Lubaba radiallahu anhu, besides making dua for her son Abdullah ibn Abbas, is she's now taking him to actually have access to the Prophet. And this is the hadith that I teach my, well, if you're, if you're on campus, welcome halaqa on Thursday is this hadith, heads up. <laughs> but Al Abbas radiallahu anhu, he's saying one of the days where I was riding with the Prophet. They're famous. Like, can you imagine? Like, and then we were driving, and I was riding shotgun, and the Prophet ﷺ was driving. You know, you know, as you do, it's just riding with the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ looks at him. He says, "Yeah, ya ghulam, oh young man, inni alimuka kalimat. I'm going to teach you these words." He's telling him, like, watch attention, pay attention, watch this. This is important. Listen up. And he tells him, "Ihfadillah yahfadak. Be mindful of Allah. Allah will be mindful of you. Ihfadillah tajidhu tajahak." Be mindful of Allah and Allah will be facing you. Allah will like personally be taking care of you. If you ask, ask Allah. If you rely, rely on Allah. And know that if the whole ummah got together with something to benefit you, with something that can't benefit you with something except that Allah has already pre-written for you. And if they all get together to harm you with something, they can't harm you with something except that Allah has already written for you. The pens have been lifted and the ink has dried. SubhanAllah. Her being in Medina means that we have this hadith so her son can learn it from the Prophet ﷺ. Her son was actually an advisor to Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anh. He was 13 years old when the Prophet ﷺ passed away. Again, we can't dismiss the young people. SubhanAllah. Oh, so much. Okay, way too much. I'm just going to try to wrap up. Lubaba radiallahu anh had passed away during the time of Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anh. 
continue to be a support for different people in the Ummah. I just wanted to stop in, for a second and point out that her son Abdullah ibn Abbas عنه, was known for his knowledge in the Ummah. Her nephew Khalil ibn Walid عنه, was known for his military might. And in one of the narrations from the narration, from, I don't know what's happening with the microphones. Oh. Well, we should have done that a long time ago. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Sufyan ibn Ayayna, in one of the narrations, says that the, the women of um, Hilal, al-Hilal, because she's al hilaliyah from Bani Hilal, they mothered so many of these leaders of Mecca. Some of them had political power, some of them had military power, some of them had knowledge, which in and of itself is power. And she's the mother of the one that actually had the knowledge. And I want to, like, subhanAllah, this is a form of power. We don't realize the power that knowledge gives us. It can make every, like an entire, like our communities are made of people. If we change our behaviors and all become different, the, the, the ayah says, Allah doesn't change what is with the people until they change what is within themselves. We look at these huge systems. How are we supposed to end systemic racism? The well, system was made by people. We'll change the people and we'll change the system. SubhanAllah. That's how the system has actually become changed. I don't know if that was a cheer, but woohoo, alhamdulillah. <laughs> Allah. <laughs> okay, wait, I'm not done yet. <laughs> Last thing. I just want to say that community building in and of itself is a form of knowledge. And this is the knowledge that Lubaba radiallahu anha, the one who is known for her wisdom, the one whose name actually means the core and the essence, the qalb. This is what her name means. That is the wisdom that she, she possessed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gifted her. Community building is a form of knowledge. It's a form of scholarship. When we talk about scholarship, a lot of the times we think, who can quote all the different four madhahab and this and that and knows all the dala'al. That is a form of scholarship. Community building is also a form of scholarship. And I say this because sometimes you walk into, you go into different Muslim spaces and a lot of the times it's unthanked women that are the ones that are actually building the community, that are calling, who's, who's in trouble, let me call her, who needs this, let's figure out, let's, what's happening? It's usually the women. I want us to know that that in and of itself is a form of knowledge, it's a form of ilm and it's a form of scholarship. And that was the scholarship of our mother Lubaba radiallahu anha. Allahu Akbar, subhanAllah, she inherited it from her friend Khadija radiallahu anha to be the mother of the ummah, one of the mothers of the ummah, whether she birthed that child or not, subhanAllah. May Allah accept from us all, and may Allah allow us to live along the footsteps of Sayyida Lubaba radiallahu anha. Jazakum la khayran. Hopefully you all know Dr. Rani Awad, she is... Uh, co-founder of the Rahma Foundation. She's a clinical associate professor of psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. She's director of the Muslim Mental Health Lab and Wellness Program and the director of the Diversity Clinic. And she, she pursued her psychiatric residency training at Stanford and completed a postdoctoral clinical research fellowship with the National Institute of Mental Health. I have to say she's a transplant too. We pulled her from the Midwest. Uh, so her courses at Stanford range from teaching a pioneering uh, study on Islamic psychology, instructing medical students and residents on implicit bias, and integrating culture and religion into medical care, to teaching undergraduate and graduate students the psychology of xenophobia. Her most recent academic publications include edited, the edited volume on Islamophobia and psychiatry, Islamic psychiatry, an upcoming text on Muslim mental health, She's done so much, mashallah. And now she's doing Maristan. We started Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. Alhamdulillah, we've had the honor of really hearing of so many of our wonderful and blessed mothers of the believers, our sahabiyat, our women role models. And now, inshallah, we're going to hear of yet another one. Today, inshallah, I'm going to share with you about Baraka. Baraka bin Talibah otherwise known as Umm Ayman. And as I tell you a little bit about her life, there is something very unique about her that no other, not just no other woman, no other person in history has been able to accomplish. 
or is, can claim that this is something, you know, for them. This is unique to Baraka. But I'm not going to tell you what that is, because inshallah you're going to listen very intently <laughs> and tell me at the very end what that is. Now, Ustadh of Husayna at the very beginning shared with us about Sumeya. That was the very first lecture today. And she said there were three characteristics. So let me test you a little bit. Just a little quiz here. What were the three characteristics of Sumeya, radiallahu anha, that she said at the very beginning about her? She was? Wow, mashallah, amazing. She was Abyssinian. She was 20 years older than the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and she was a slave. Tamam. You were listening. Allahu Akbar. Mashallah. <laughs> Now, Baraka, who we're going to talk about here, shares almost all the same characteristics with one slight difference. Like Sumeya, she's also from Abyssinia. We don't know a lot about her roots, her parents, or her lineage, but we know that she's Abyssinian. We also know that she was a slave, and we also know that she was older than the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but not quite as old as Sumeya. She was probably something like 10 years or less older than the Prophet ﷺ. Some narrations, they don't have exact numbers, they say maybe six, seven, eight, somewhere in that range, less than 10 years older than the Prophet ﷺ. So here's what we know, and make sure you're keeping track. Keep track with me all the dates and times as we talk about them, and also keep track of the special, unique characteristic about her as we go on. So what we do know, in terms of being a servant, a slave, which in that period of time in history was the norm. Of course, Islam is going to come later and abolish this slowly but surely, and we'll see this directly in her own life. But in that period of time, slavehood was common, and she was in the household of whom? Who? Whose household was she part of? Huh? Before? No. Maybe somebody said, yes, somebody said it. Abdullah. Who's Abdullah? The father of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So she was in his household, taking care of him, serving him, yeah, as a servant may in a household. And what we know is that once he married who? Amina, right? The mother of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Baraka continued to follow him to that household where he was married to Amina, and she served Sayyida Amina as well. Now the story goes, and so much of the life of Sayyida Amina, the mother of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that we know, actually is directly narrated by Baraka herself, because she was the one in the household. In fact, she says many times she was the only one in the household. So, so much about Amina's pregnancy and her entire time being pregnant with the Prophet وسلم, and delivery, a lot of it's narrated by Baraka herself. So what do we know about her? Here's what we know. We know, for example, that she was treated very kindly, unlike most slaves, by Abdullah, the father of the Prophet وسلم, and by Amina. And that when she, uh, within a couple of weeks of marriage, Abdullah was called by his father. Who's his father? Abdul Muttalib. Right, the grandfather of the Prophet وسلم, and asked to go, with, to go to a caravan to Syria. Amina was upset. She said, I'm just a few weeks married and my husband's going to leave. And he did in fact go with a caravan following his father's orders and she was alone. Baraka says, I was with her. I took care of her. And she became so sad that she was bedridden. She didn't want to leave the bed. So Baraka served her. And she said she would sleep right at the foot of her bed so that if she was needing anything at all, she would help her and nurture her and take care of her. This is really important because it's a very close, close relationship. And in this period of time, Amina is really sad and she talks about that. But then one night, she wakes up and she's so excited, so excited, and she's just beaming with joy, something like you haven't seen before. And so Baraka is narrating the story. And she says, Amina woke up and she said, Baraka, I had the strangest dream. And it's a beautiful dream. She said, I could see from my abdomen light. And the light is emanating. And everywhere I look from the east to the west, there is light everywhere. 
And so at this point, Baraka says to her, do you think you might be pregnant? And so she says, I don't feel pregnant. As women feel pregnant, they feel the physical difficulty of pregnancy. She said, I don't feel this way. But later, she narrates, because she was asked this question again later, did you feel pregnant? And she said, I didn't even know why I was pregnant. And what she narrates is something really beautiful. She says, when I was between asleep and awakened state, I heard a voice say to me, you are carrying the leader of a nation. You are carrying the next prophet. And she kind of, you know, when you kind of hear something, you're startled by the voice, like, where did this come from? And she said she heard that in the beginning of her pregnancy, towards the beginning, and she heard that again at the very end, right before she delivered. The same voice. And she said that's how it was confirmed to me that I was pregnant, because I never felt pregnant the way other women may feel the pregnancy of the Prophet Muhammad So here she was pregnant and being taken care of by Barakah. And at one point, Abd al-Muttalab, who continues to visit her, her father-in-law, continues to visit her, check on her, see how she's doing. He visits her and he says, you need to leave this area that we are. We are all leaving Mecca. We have to go into the hills, the mountains, to hide. Because news has reached to us that there is a leader from Yemen that has come and is going to destroy the Kaaba. Who is this? Abraha. News had reached them that Abraha and his whole army is coming to destroy the Kaaba. And she said, I'm too weak. I'm not able to leave this, this bed. So you could see Abdul Baraka narrates, you could see Abdul Muttalib getting kind of a little agitated, like he wants his daughter in law and, and the baby that she's carrying to be safe. So he wants her to go. And so he, she says to him, she says, the Kaaba is protected by its Lord, and he will never reach the Kaaba. He will never even enter Mecca, she said. And so even though he was kind of upset and he wanted her to go, he let her be because she, he said to her himself, she's got a good point. <laughs> Allah will never let the Kaaba be destructed. SubhanAllah. So here she is continuing on. A couple months more into this story, the people who had gone to the caravan to Syria started to return. Little by little, little by little, and everybody's welcoming them. They're excited to have them back. It's an arduous journey. It's difficult. Baraka says she sneaks out, and she sees every time new people come, more people come back from the caravan, she's trying to figure out, is Abdullah with them? Is Abdullah with them? Did he come back? So that she can give news to Amina. He never seems to appear with any of the people who are coming back. Finally, she hears some whispering that he didn't actually make it. But she doesn't want to be the one to tell Amina. So she waits until finally there is actually confirmation that on the way back from Syria, they stopped in Yathrib. What is the city that we today call Yathrib? Medina. His maternal uncles and aunts were in Medina, and he stopped there to visit them after the return of the caravan. But Medina also had a terrible illness that many people who were not from Medina would get sick when they would go. They'd get a fever. And with that illness, he had a fever. And after a month of battling with it, he actually passed away. And he was buried there in Yathrib. When the news came, Barakah happened to be in the house of Abdul Muttalib. And she heard it and she said, I screamed. I just, you know, like when you lose your, it just suddenly, it, something affects you suddenly. And she said, I can't even remember what I did. All I know is I have ran to Amina and I told her the news. And she said, at that point, Amina fainted. And so here she is, pregnant, with the news of her husband, who's just, just newlyweds. And she's going to now raise this baby that's in her womb alone. And not only that, but it's you know, shocking to your system altogether. And so now, Baraka says, at this point, I continue to nurse her and help her and take care of her as she was continuing the rest of her pregnancy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send, sent beautiful messages to Amina all throughout the pregnancy. There were all these signs and things that were happening that she was carrying in her womb, some, someone who was very, very important. And this helped comfort her throughout this into a very difficult period of time. 
Now, Baraka says that she continued to take care of her until the baby was delivered. And on that night, she was the very first person to hold the baby. She was the very first one to hold the Prophet Muhammad And she witnessed so many miracles that she narrates. There were other women there too, she wasn't the only one. For example, you have, for example, other women who were there that particular night, and they narrate some beautiful stories from that night. Remember the dream that Amina had about light that she saw everywhere? That night, all of the women who were there, who were helping in the delivery process, they too could see light emanating. Amina herself said, I could see light that lit up the entire, all the hills and mountains of Mecca. I could see so far from this light. And other women talked about how the stars were so bright, it was so low as though they were going to fall right in your lap. SubhanAllah. And there were other really amazing signs that not just happened in that room, in that house that was where the Prophet was delivered, but also throughout other countries and other nations. Like they talk about, for example, in Persia, how the emperor there, there was a flame, there was a fire that was being kept in Persia for over a thousand years, and that night it went out. And how when the castles of some of the rulers as far out on either side of the world parts of their buildings crumbled now people didn't know because later they were going later they kind of connected all the stories together and they found that it was on the birth night of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the jewish people of mecca and medina especially from medina side they knew that someone special in fact in their books it said that this particular star when it emerged that means ahmed was born and they knew the next prophet was named Ahmed, but they didn't know who he was going to be, whom he was going to be, what family he was going to be born into. And so when no one was born on their side, they went to Quraysh and said, did anyone get born on your side? And at first they didn't know. And eventually when they heard news, it was Amina who had a baby that night. There were these amazing narrations where they said to them, we're so sad. Because it means prophecy was taken out of Bani Israel and has now went to Quraysh. They knew. At least the early ones did. And so there were so many, we can go on and on in the seat of the Prophet وسلم, about the amazing miracles of his birth and of that night. Back to Baraka, she talks about how not only was she there to help with the actual birthing process of the, of the Prophet وسلم, but also his first few hours and days, and especially in the beginning as they decided and tried to figure out who would be his wet nurse. And you know the story of Halima. So we'll, inshallah, another day come to that story because you know it, inshallah. But she wasn't, Baraka wasn't the wet nurse. She was the person who followed from his father's home, Abdullah, to his mother, to the shared married home of Abdullah and Amina. And now she's going to continue serving Amina as she now has this young baby. But we know that the Prophet Sallallahu for the next five years goes with Halima Saadiyah to the Bedu, to the Bedu right? for the fresh air and the beautiful Arabic tongue that he would learn, and so on and so forth. And in those five years, Baraka stayed back with Amin and she took care of her onward. Always there, always in the background, always taking care. Now, five years pass, and there's an incident that happens that we won't go into in much detail, but you all know the incident. What is the incident that Halima, even though she really wanted to keep the Prophet وسلم, well past his nursing days, because of how much baraka, how much blessings he brought that household. She, what is the incident that brought him back? When she rushed back to give him back to his mother. Yes, the incident in which his brother, actually his, in, by nursing, saw two men come and open up the, open up the chest of the Prophet وسلم, and do something. It was terrifying to him, right? He came back and his face was all as pale, you know, ashen terrified of what happened and at this point Halima said I can't take responsibility for something like this happening and she rushed him back to his mother and the mother asked what happened and she said oh I'm just giving him back <laughs> and she said you were so insistent on keeping him what happened and so she told the story and this is the beautiful thing not just of the mother Amina but the, the firmness of faith the same thing when she said Abraha will never be able to reach the Kaaba and of course he never did the same thing happened here where she said, no harm will ever come to someone who Allah has protected. Right? She's, she's very firm about this. 
So the Prophet is returned to her household and Barakah says how excited she was that the Prophet Muhammad is now back in their household and she can take care of him again along with his mother. Now this is at year five. One year later, at year six, is when Amina decides that he's, the Prophet is old enough to go visit the grave of his father. So she's going to travel from Mecca to Yathrib, which Medina was then called as we talked about, Yathrib. And they went to Yathrib. And Abdul Muttalib tried to tell her, and Barakah tried to tell her, there's a fever there, don't go there, people get sick there. But she really wanted to visit the grave of her husband. So she went, and the Prophet Muhammad went as well, and so did Barakah. Barakah said the entire journey that took 10 days, she carried the Prophet right, the six-year-old, and the entire time he was holding on to her, <laughs> and the entire ride. When they arrive there, the Prophet's maternal aunts and uncles are in Yathrib. So the Prophet talks about staying with them, and they stayed about a month. Every day, Amina would leave and go visit the graveyard. And then she'd come back and visit the graveyard and come back. And this was her journey for about a month. When the month passed, now it's time for them to go back to Mecca. Halfway through the trip, she gets sick with that fever. And she falls really sick. And they're in a halfway point between Mecca and Medina. Anyone know what that city is called? Abwa, yeah. And so she's there, and Barakah talks about taking care of her. And so she's taking care of this very sick person, subhanAllah. And there's a, like, a six-year-old boy. And one day, she got so sick, the mother, Amina, got so sick that she whispered into Barakah's ears and she said, I'm not going to make it. I'm going to die here. I'm asking you to take care of my son. Never leave him from your sight. So Barakah is trying to muster up all of her courage, and she promises her that she will take care of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And sure enough, that day she dies. And Barakah talks about how she herself, with her own bare hands, dug out from the sand a grave for Amina. She said her tears moistened the very sand with which she was digging the grave. And she herself buried Amina in this grave in Ebwa. And then, now she has a six-year-old boy that she promised her mother, the mother that she would take care of. Now, it's not a small thing to go from where she was back to Mecca completely alone. There is a caravan, but she's completely alone in charge of this little boy. How old is Baraka? Does anyone know at this stage how old she is? Oh, good. So there's some guesses. There's various guesses. We don't have an exact age, but what we know is that she was definitely no older than a teenager. Definitely no older than a teenager. Some, the earliest, say maybe a 12, 12 years old. Others say maybe she was a little older of a teenager, but no older than that. So this is a massive responsibility that now you're in charge of a six-year-old, not only to return him back to safety, but he is the pride of Quraysh. His father was the pride of Quraysh, and Amina was the Sayyidah of Quraysh. She brings him back first to his grandfather, and who takes him in, and Barakah stays there too. Because anywhere the Prophet goes, she's going to go. This is her son. She feels that Amina told her, this is your son, you're going to take care of him. And for some period of time, he's with the grandfather. Then as you know, the grandfather passes away. And where does he go? To his uncle, who? Abu Talib. And Barakah follows along. So how many households has she been part of? Hmm. Right? Everywhere, essentially, the Prophet goes, she goes. Now, the Prophet وسلم, lives in the household of Abu Talib until he becomes a young man. Until the story that you might remember from an earlier conference when we talked about Sayyidah Khadija and how he stayed actually in the household of his uncle until he married Sayyidah Khadija. And Barakah is right along with him, mashallah, <laughs> this entire time. Now, when he gets married to Sayyidah Khadija, he's going to move into Sayyidah Khadija's house. Who comes with him? <laughs> Barakah. But here something different happens. Now, he finally has, remember, he didn't come from wealth. He's an orphan. His family is well off, a beautiful lineage. But the house he was in, Abu Talib, 
was not a wealthy household. And he worked as a shepherd, you might remember. You might remember the story from the previous conference that when, the, when a friend of Sayyidah Khadija, her cousin friend, came to ask about her and she said, oh Muhammad, why aren't you married yet? And he said, I don't have the means. Right? And she said, well, what if the person was smart and beautiful and wealthy and you didn't have to worry about that? He said, who's that? <laughs> and she said, I'll take care of it, mashallah. And so this, this, by the way, we said this at the last conference, this is the importance of not doing this on your own, of having trusted friends and people to actually help you in this process, even if you're the one who's asking someone else's hand in marriage as a woman. And so here we are. Now he finally has, he's standing on his own two feet, right? He's now a married man and able to, the, able to have his own finances. And so the very first thing he does is he frees Barakah. He says, I don't want you to be a slave. You have your freedom completely. Despite that, Baraka says, I want to live with you. She says, how does, a, how does a mother let go of her son? And so she moves in to the household, even as a freed woman, into the household of Khadija and the Prophet ﷺ. Now let me tell you something. In that other conference, you might remember we talked about Khadija and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had promised her paradise and there was a very specific language in the Qur'an and what, she's, what in paradise she's promised. Does anyone remember that? I know I'm quizzing you from like a while ago. What is it? I guess? Yes, but what, about, what, what specifically? What's the language of it? Anyone remember? Yes, Allahu Akbar, you remember, Allahu Akbar. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, some of the tafsir explanations say that, there's, that in this majestic castle that she's going to be given in Jannah, there is no toil or trouble. And some of the mufassirin say it also means there was no noise. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why the no noise? What was happening in the household of Khadija? How many people were in that household? Let's count. You have... We talked about Khadija, you have her own family, because Khadija was twice married and twice widowed before the Prophet Muhammad She had her own children. And at that point in time, at least Hind was there. Okay, who else? When the Prophet gets married to Khadija, he also brings some people along. Who does he bring? Ali ibn Abi Talib. Who else? Baraka, yes. Who else? Zayd ibn Haritha, mashallah, the adopted, if you will, son of the Prophet sallallahu In fact, that's what he was called. He was called Zayd ibn Muhammad for the longest time, right? Until the verse came down and explained that adoption is different in Islam. And then you have all the children who Khadija is going to bear for the Prophet sallallahu And how many were they? Huh? There were six in total. Two of the sons, of course, as we know, died in infancy. Four daughters. How many people are in that household? Allah someone said a lot. <laughs> there were a lot of people in the household. A lot of young people in that household. And so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to her, you are promised no noise. <laughs> we know what he's talking about. SubhanAllah. But all these people, people always talk about today, we talk about blended families. You want to see a blended family that's living so beautifully. You have step people, you have fostered people, you have adopted people, you have biological people, you have all kinds of blending happening in this family. And it is said it was the most peaceful and happy home in all of Mecca. Really, something to study, truly, and to learn about family dynamics. Another day for another time, inshallah. But as we go, go, keep going here, Baraka is living in this household, and she's so happy. One day, the Prophet and Sayyidah Khadija say to her, and let's think about how old do you think when this story happens? They say to her, you're getting a little bit older now. Why don't you get married and settle down? Right? You've served me so long and served my family so long. How about you have your own family? And she said, who am I going to marry? Oh, Rasulullah. And so he introduces the idea of someone who had come to ask for her. Anybody know who? Hmm, little Sira quiz here. Hmm? Maybe? Ubaid. Yes. She married Ubaid ibn Zayd. And they had a son. The son's name was Ayman. This is why Baraka's other name is Umm Ayman. 
So sometimes in the, in the seerah, you'll see her written as Barakah, and sometimes you'll see it as Umm Ayman. Now, unfortunately, Ubaid died very soon after their marriage. So it didn't actually last very long because he died very soon thereafter. So here she is with Ayman. Once her husband dies, she's like in her 30s at this point, whose household does she go back to? Right back to the Prophet But this time she brings Ayman along. So even more people coming back into the household of the Prophet She says, this is my household. Every time something happens, she's right back to the Prophet to be there because she loves being there. So at this point in time, now, very soon after this story, you have the revelation comes to the Prophet How old was the Prophet when he received revelation? How old would she have been? What did we say? No, she's older. Uh, yeah, that, not maybe 50 or not quite 50. Maybe, yeah, about seven, eight years or so older than him. So she's not a young person. And within those first few years, Dar al-Arqam, where they were meeting and talking about Islam in those early years, was very dangerous. And she would risk her life often to go there and especially to, exist, to bring news about what the mushrikeen were doing. And so she often actually put her life on the line. And one of these nights where she really could have lost her life, the Prophet ﷺ thanked her. And then when she left, he turned to his sahaba and he said, if any of you want to marry a woman of Jannah, marry Umm Ayman. Hmm. How old did we say she was? Yeah, close to 50. Who came forward? Hmm, who? Zayd ibn Haritha. Zayd ibn Haritha came forward. What's the age difference? Ah. Well, let's count. If she's about 50, yeah? He was at least, they say, at least 20 years younger. So it wasn't just the Prophet Muhammad and Sayyidah Khadija that had the big age gap. What's their age gap? No, 15. 15 years, yeah. And what's the age gap between Zayd bin Haritha and Umm Ayman? Barakah? About 20. When people say these funny ideas, all these weird cultural norms that we sometimes have of it can't be like this and it can't be like that and they can't be younger and they can't be older or the first sibling can't get married until the second one can't get married until the first sibling gets married and Fatabarakallah. It's a little exhausting, honestly. <laughs> and we say, what about our early examples? Zayd bin Haritha said, Oh Rasulullah, I will marry her. He said, because he just heard the Prophet say she is a woman of Jannah. He said, she will be better than anyone who is younger, more beautiful, or comes from a better lineage. Because we don't know her roots. Right? And the Quraysh, they were very particular about their lineage and roots. Right? SubhanAllah. And sure, sure enough, Zayd bin Haritha married Umm Ayman and they had a son. What was the son's name? This is an important, very important. Oh, they're all important. <laughs> very important here though. Who? Usama bin Zayd. Now, the Prophet ﷺ would say about Zayd himself, he would call him his beloved. And so when his son was born, Usama, what do you think Usama's name became? The beloved of the beloved of Rasulullah. Isn't that beautiful? The beloved of the beloved of Rasulullah. I mean, high, high status that these people had, ya subhanAllah. And he too grew up in the household of the Prophet wasallam. Why? Because Zayd was already there. <laughs> so was Barakah. And so therefore, so was Usama. Literally raised and nurtured in the household of the Prophet wasallam. SubhanAllah. So then we move forward, inshallah, on the story here. And we continue here. And now you have, and I didn't say this earlier, but I want to say this, that every time the Prophet وسلم, would talk to Umm Ayman, he would call her Ya Ummi. Like that was his name for her. Oh, my mother, Ummi. So beautiful, subhanAllah. And so um, some beautiful things about her that you should know, that whenever it is, that anyone asked her about how she was doing, she would say, her, 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 her line that she always say is, I'm fine as long as Islam is fine. She was so strong about it. She too went to the battlefields. She too nursed the ill on the battlefields. She too 
held strong, and was always serving and nurturing, always from behind. SubhanAllah. Not in the limelight, not somebody would see and know, but guaranteed paradise and always serving. SubhanAllah. When the Prophet وسلم, passed away, Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Umar went to her because they knew that she was in the maqam or the place of the mother of the Prophet وسلم. He would call her Ya Ummi. And so they went to give her condolences, knowing that how sad she must be. When they entered in to see her and to give her their condolences, they found her crying, tears in her eyes. And so they tried to console her and say, no, no, the prophets, you know, you know, with Allah, this is Allah's decree, this is better, this is, you know, they were, they were trying to figure out what to say to what would be like the mother of the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so she stopped them immediately. And she said, that's not why I'm crying. She said, I'm not crying because the prophet died. She said, by Allah, I knew the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would die. That's not why I'm crying. We all knew one day he would die. Why I'm crying is because now that he is dead, revelation, wahi, has ended for all of us. That's why she was crying. And so they said, we came in to console her for her crying. We started crying along with her. <laughs> and she started to console us. SubhanAllah. Can you imagine being in that room with those amazing people who were the closest to the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam? So Barakah was not only somebody who was very close to the Prophet وسلم, and essentially part of his household, but when someone is that close to someone so beloved, they can't bear much longer after they die. And so a lot of the you know, narrations say that it was only months, five, six months perhaps after the Prophet's death that she, death, that she too passed away. Some say it was in the Khalafa of Sayyidina Uthman, which is soon thereafter. So now that I've shared this part with you, I want you to walk through this timeline with me. How many households was she part of that the Prophet was part of? How many did you count? Yeah. Count with me. Which ones? The house of Abdullah. The house of Amin and Abdullah. The house of Abdul Muttalib. The house of Abu Talib. The house of Khadija and the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, And? And I guess you could say when they moved from Mecca to Medina, there was another home, of course, that, they, that she was part of. So what is it that's unique about her? What is it that no other human can claim? Allahu Akbar! Because some people were saying birth, but there were other people at the birth. And some people were saying, what? The death, but some other people were at the death too. Huh, what's unique about her? She was literally the only, not woman, the only human who was with the Prophet وسلم, essentially from birth until death. No other person can claim that. No other person lived that long or lived through and was with him in all of those stages. Mecca and Medina and back and forth. Nothing. Nobody else. So when we say this is somebody who we have to take that kind of um, inspiration from, it truly is the case. And so as we would say that even though we don't know her roots and origins, other than that she was from Abyssinia, we know where she's going, to Jannah. And that's what matters. So with that, inshallah, I hope we reflect deeply on what that means to be in service of others, to be somebody who's constantly helping because it may not be that any one of us is necessarily our life, the way it ends up shaping up, is that we are in the forefront. You've heard of some of the others, as Dada Maria mentioned, different, different tabiyas, different characteristics. Um Ayman was definitely someone who was much quieter and much more in the background, but there and always there. And absolutely carried Islam and helped carry Islam from the beginning until the death of the Prophet and her own death. The death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So inshallah, with that, we'll close. And I hope, inshallah, that inspires us to, to really be from any one of these women that you've heard, any one of them. The Prophet said, 
and my sahaba, my companions, and this is male and female, are like the stars. Ashabi kan nujum. Whoever it is that you seek guidance from to, to follow in their example, you, you will be guided. So I hope, inshallah, with all the people that we hear today, you find your star to guide you, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Thank you, Dr. Rania, for that beautiful and inspiring uh, presentation, I think. Next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Haifa Yunus. <laughs> Dr. Haifa, inshallah, is going to speak uh, about strength personified. Uh, Nuseiba radiallahu anha. Uh, Dr. Haifa Yunus is an American board certified obstetrician and gynecologist with roots in Iraq. Her pursuit of Islamic knowledge was initiated when she began to study with various Islamic scholars from across the United States. At the same time, she simultaneously attended individual courses and lectures on subjects including Aqidah, Fiqh, Usul al-Fiqh, Hadith, and Tazkiyah. From the United States, she moved to Saudi Arabia, where she graduated from the Mecca Institute of Islamic Studies in Jeddah and Al-Huda Quran Memorization School in Jeddah, where she completed the memorization of the Quran. She is the founder and chairwoman of Jannah Institute. Which reminds me, Dr. Haifa currently, is, she teaches seminars uh, on the thematic commentary of various chapters of the Holy Quran and, and their practical relevance, relevance in our day. She's also on TikTok now. <laughs> Somebody's managing the, the account for her. She's not doing her own TikTok. They're taking her content, alhamdulillah, and, and using it for da'wah, which we appreciate. Um, because you have to have more positivity in the world. So we welcome Dr. Haifa again, inshallah. This is her third time coming to our program, and we're so happy. Assalamu alaikum. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi, wa man wala, Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima alamtana, inna ka sami'u mujibu dua. اللهم إني أعوذ بك من علم لا ينفع وقلب لا يخشع ونفس لا تشبع ودعاء لا يسمع ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحم إنك أنت الوهاب رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي جزاكم الله خير for coming may Allah reward you may Allah reward everybody may Allah reward the organizers there's a lot of خير came from this um, conference actually I don't know if some of you followed uh, my Instagram account. There's a young girl, literally, it was Friday, what's today? Sunday, Friday, or I think Thursday night, someone sent this video to my Instagram, through Messenger, actually. And I just saw a young girl. It's like, okay, then I don't know why Allah made me open. I normally don't. Honestly, I mean, please forgive me, but I really don't have time for all that. But I, for some reason, Allah wanted me to check the Messenger and wanted me to see, and it was a young girl. And I clicked it, and guess what this girl was doing? It was here, is why I'm saying this. It was last conference here, and of course I don't remember what I said, but somebody made a clip of it, and the clip went all over. So this girl was doing exactly the clip. It's amazing, and she was doing it the same way. Like, you know, if I paused, she paused, right? And then I even, and, and I remember, yeah, you can see it. If you're on Instagram, you'll see it. But there's a reason why I'm sharing this. Because I remember as I was saying how much time, it was about salah, how much time we spent for Allah. And then I said how much time we spent on Instagram and on, on our social media. And somebody I remember very well in front of me, and I said, in the kitchen, and somebody laughed in front of me. And I, at that moment, moment, I said, it's not funny. And I said it in a certain tone. And this girl said exactly the same. It's not funny. It's, Anyway, her mother, this is what I want to say. And the reason I said this, because I was asked about six or eight months ago, I was in upstate New York, and the board of a masjid with the imam asked me this question. If you are in the da'wah, and my beautiful sisters and mentors and uh, teachers here on the left, they know, you sometimes reach a point where you say, this is getting nowhere from what you hear. You don't see it, we see it, we hear it. So the Sheikh was asking me, and he says, 
Dr. Haifa, do you think what you are doing is bringing any fruit? And I know why he was asking this. And I said, Wallah, ya Sheikh, I don't know. Allah knows. And nobody is going to praise themselves. But I can tell you, I, every now and then I get an email or I get something that gives me hope. And Allah sent me this, and then I didn't know who's this woman. So I actually responded, which I rarely do that. I responded on the messenger and says, who is this girl? And her mother responded. Now this is for all of you. She said, she's 11 years old. Where does she live? Australia. In a city, I don't know where is this place. And she said she loves the videos and she memorized them. Now, two things came to my mind first. Who introduced her to these videos? That's what I want you to know. This is an 11 years old. I doubt she has an Instagram account. And she looks actually like nine. So it is the mother. So here you are, mothers. What do you watch? What do you see? It comes to your home and has an influence. And you just heard all the beautiful stories. And then the encouragement. This is what really impressed me. Because who posted this? It's the mother. Because at the end, the mother was communicating with me and I took her permission. It's like, is it okay if we post it on, online? And then, then the team did this, where they put mine and hers. I was talking, she's talking, so that you know this is. So the idea, what I am trying to say is, whatever you do in the house, negative or positive, it has an impact on your children. So don't blame the school. And I'm not saying the school has no impact, but don't blame the school first. Don't blame the friends first. The thing that you need to always look internally to yourself is what impact I had on my children, on my family, on the community, and on the society. And that's what we have been learning since one o'clock. A good number of you probably don't know the names. You may have heard of Umm Ayman, but I don't know how many of you knew her name was Baraka. But what an impact she had. So what I want to end up with, and subhanAllah, I didn't choose Nusayba, but I was hoping I would be assigned Nusayba. Literally, I, at first I wanted to text to Stada Husayn and ask, like, you know, give me Nusayba, but I was like, no, let Allah choose for me. Honestly, I always like Allah to choose for me, because Allah is the best one who choose for you. And then she texted and says, Nusayba, and I said, subhanAllah, this is what I wanted. The question, all of you, before I even talk about uh, Sayyida Nusayba, who are you? From all what you heard, who are you? And number two, what impact, what legacy you're going to leave after you? Who's going to talk about you in a hundred years from now? Who's going to remember your name? Which conference is going to mention you? True or false? What do I need to do? I have to do something. Majority of people don't know, don't do. It has to be very hard. It has to be very difficult. Against the flow. And if you read, if you listen to all these stories, what was the common between everybody? They were different. They did something nobody else did. They said something nobody else said, and I'll come to Sayyid and Usaybah. This is what you all need. This is why we do these conferences. It's just not only general information. You can type the name Baraka and you will get it on the internet. But that's not the goal. The goal is you, 10, 20, 30, 50 years from now, we're all going to be gone. What did I leave? Some of these ladies didn't have children. Or their children died before them, like Sayyid and Usaybah. But what a legacy they left. So this is the first thing every woman, and I focus on the woman, what legacy you're going to leave behind you. And for the youth, what's your goal? I don't want to hear college name. Honestly. And I don't want to hear, I want to do this and I want to do that. I want to hear what legacy you're going to leave. And what did you do for Islam? What did you do for Islam? That was very hard, very difficult, and majority of people did not do it. 
And this is, takes us to Nusayba, Ummu Amara, as they call her. Who is she? We don't even know her age. We don't know anything about her before she became a Muslim. Very different from the others. Nobody knows. Why? That's something for you to remember. Because nobody will remember you unless you do something different. And that's why no one talked about her till she came to give allegiance to Rasulullah So this is about 1440, about 1430 plus years. So Rasulullah was still in Mecca. She was from Medina. She was Ansariya, as they call it. So she was born, raised in Medina, from Benul Najjar. But nobody knows anything about her at that point. And then, Rasulullah sent the first ambassador in Islam. Who was that? You all should know the name. There's only one. The first ambassador in Islam, who was he? Who he was? Or Rasulullah sent him to Medina. No. Mu'ad ibn Jabal was sent to Yemen. I, I heard it. Yes, Sayyidina Mus'ab ibn Umair was the first ambassador who Rasulullah wanted to see if he will migrate to Medina. Will that be a good place? Planning, investigating, researching, searching. So he did. And Sayyidina Musa ibn Umair did an amazing job. What happened afterward? You should all know this. But I don't want to talk about the seerah. I want to talk about points that should impact you and me as a woman. 74 people from Medina decided to come to Mecca and meet a Rasul Seven four. How many women among them? How many women? Only two. What's the ratio? It doesn't matter the number. It doesn't, what matters is what did you do? So, Ummu Amara and Asma, both of them. They didn't jump on Rasul and I'm coming and I have to do this. You can be very powerful and impactful, but in the right way. You don't even have to raise your voice. You don't have to go and write and do, but do the right thing. So what did they do? They wanted to give allegiance to Rasul This is Bay'at al-Aqaba, the second one. She left Medina. She came with her husband and two of her sons and her sister. Came coming to Rasul But they didn't go to him and say, I want to do it. She sent the husband of Asma to Rasul and he said, Ya Rasulullah, the woman wants to give you the allegiance like the men. And what did he say? You need to know this, because there's a hukum here. There's a fiqh ruling we're going to learn. What did he say? What did he say? You're close, but what did he say? He said, that's fine. Let them come and give the allegiance, but I will not shake their hands. Because normally, how do you give allegiance to someone? You put your hand on top of their hand. He said, I will not. Did they get offended? Why me? Discrimination? Because I'm a woman? You know my point? Again, I'll say this every time I speak to women. Don't fall in that trap. Focus on the goal. They came because they want to make a statement. What was the statement? That Nusayba did on that day. That the woman faith is as strong as the man faith. And whatever it will take to show this faith, she'll do it. So she came, gave the allegiance to Rasulullah went back to Medina. Nobody knows much now. Till when? Till when? When do we know her? Uhud, exactly. How many years? At least five, right? At least five or six, Uhud after Badr. What happened here? Women always, when they go for expeditions with the Rasulullah what do they do? They usually, in the back, serve the fighters or, 
or or take her care of the wounded. And that's what she did. Now, if you learn the rest, you will say, anybody else in this day, no, no, no. I don't want to stay in the back. No. I am as strong as them. I want to be in the front. Are you getting my point? She didn't. She was in the back. When did she come to the front? And this is a lesson for all of you. Wait till Allah use you. Don't jump to it. She didn't go out to make a statement. And so history will talk about her. And Rasul said this famous more than one statement about her. That's not her purpose. She went to serve Allah. She went to serve Allah the way usually woman serves Allah. But Allah had another plan for her. And what happened? What happened? Come on. It's Uhud. So as long as the Muslims were winning, she was in the back. Now what happened? You all know the story. Now things turned around. And what happened to the Muslim? The fighters, companions, what happened? They ran away. And this is how it's described. And if you read, you will find the same description. Very few people, they said, less than 10. Companions, Sahaba, ran away. Very few, less than 10, stayed shielding Rasul Who was it? One of them was she and her son. She and her son. She didn't go for that. But when the opportunity comes in to serve Allah, to do something most don't do, she was there. And what happened? She did not go out as a fighter, so she doesn't even have a shield. She ran with only her sword and bear, nothing. And the Rasul is behind her. The fighters were running, and the Rasul looked at one. There's no name. And he had a shield. And he said, if you are not fighting, give me the shield. He gave him the shield, and he gave the shield to Sayyidina Nusaybah. You know what is this? Again, when Allah wants to use you, he creates the opportunity for you. And he facilitated, and he facilitated, facilitated in a way, perfection. Don't do it. Don't do it with yourself, meaning ask him to use you. But don't put orders to Allah, as I say this to myself. I want it this way or that way. I want to serve you, Ya Rabbi. You want me to serve you as a speaker? I'm here. You want me to serve you as the person who cook the food to serve the people who attend the conference? I'm there. You know what I'm saying? Don't pick and choose. This is the deen of Allah. He chooses where he wants you and where he's going to use you. And the result is the same. So her son comes in. She had two. Both of them died. But not in, uh, in Uhud. Habib and Abdullah. So Habib was running, and he, he had a wound in his arm, bleeding. And the Rasul told him, tie it and come to your mom. You, you need to feel this. It was a fiasco. It was a mess. They were losing and running. He comes in. What is she doing now? Now this is the mother. This is her son. Now this is the fighter. Look how many hats she was wearing. Now she's the nurse. She pulled her son. She had around her tied some bands because she was going out for nursing. She take one band, tie her son wound bleeding, and what does she say? Go back and fight. Look at me and you. Go back and fight. What did he tell her, alayhi salatu wasalam? No one can do what you, you just did, ya Umu Amara. 
This is one of the statements he said about her. No one can do that. Your son and everybody is being killed in the mass, bleeding. Anybody else will say, you know, he's bleeding, go home. My baby. Not Umm Amara. Not Nusayba. Allah knows you and me what would have done. And then she sees a warrior coming to kill Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa She has nothing. She's not a fighter. But when you have the faith, when you really love Allah, when he puts you in the place where he wants you to defend, I'm there. And then he comes in and they were all on horses. She was not riding. They were all standing. And that man comes in and he missed her, then turn, and then she hits the horse, and the horse fell, and the man fell, and then she killed him. Nusayba. That's why he said, We cannot do what you are doing. That's a woman, one, only. And then at that point, she said to Rasulullah, what did she say? Pray for me and my family in the middle of the battle. Pray for me and my family that we are with you in Jannah. And of course, he prayed for her. Did you see the point? In the middle of whatever, the focus is what? Is al akhirah Jannah, where I am going, what do I want to do? It's not this life, it's the way I look, uh, what I have, where is my child is going. The focus is the akhirah, including with how I use my children, because that's why she told her child, go, done. I took care of it, go back. Subhanallah, is this is done? Do you think that the only landmark of Sayyidah Nusayba is because of her courage? Then you don't know the, uh, well the seerah. There's a verse in the Quran was revealed because of her. There's a different opinion about whether it was Umm Salama or was Nusayba, Sayyidah Nusayba. What was this verse? Or what, was, what did she come and say? She came to Rasulullah and said, says, Ya Rasulullah, everything in the Quran is for the men. Now equality. Now I want my rights. But what rights she was looking for? She said, Ya Rasulullah, all the rewards goes to the men. The rewards goes to the men. What about us? And then Allah revealed. It's in Surah Al-Ahzab, which most of you, inshallah, you know the verse. In the Muslimina, or Muslimat, or Mu'minina, or Mu'minat, القانتين القانتات الصادقين الصادقات الصابرين الصابرات والخاشعين والخاشعات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات الصائمين الصائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما And this is one of the few verses where Allah divided the gender you're a Muslim, she or he. A believer, she or he. Submitting to Allah, he or she, or she and he. He started with he and she. That's when I ask for my rights. That's when I want to be equal, if not in the front run. It's not everything. That's a Sayyidah Nusayba. The other thing, her son, Abdullah, was the only Sahabi who described the wudu of a Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa What an honor. All these sahaba, it's her son, described. Third thing for her, another hukum. So I want you to know it's not about courage only. What she has that we all need, especially this day and age, the yaqeen, the certainty, the unshakable faith, I call it. This is who she was. Unshakable faith. I am a servant to Allah wherever, Ya Allah, you put me. So Rasulullah came to visit her. What was she doing? She was fasting. He was not. 
she served him food. And he said, why you are not eating, Ya Nusayba? Umm Amara said, I'm fasting, Ya Rasulullah. What did he tell her? Anybody knows? Yes. He said to her, the angels pray for the house that the owner is fasting and he serves food to people. What a faith, practicing faith, courage. Uhud was not the only one. She was involved in one of the most unique allegiance to Rasulullah That's what they say if you read about her, they tell you she is one of those who Allah said, I am pleased with her. Can you claim this? Can I claim this? How dare I am? But this one is not a claim. It's true. It's a fact. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Fatih, لَقَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ يُبَايِعُونَكَ تَحْتَ الشَّجَرَةِ فَعَلِمَ مَا فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ فَأَنزَلَ السَّكِينَةَ عَلَيْهِمْ وَأَثَابَهُمْ فَتْحًا قَرِيبًا Let's translate. Allah said, Allah is pleased. عَنِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ The believers. But who are they? Which one? Not everybody. This is specific. Those who gave you allegiance under the tree. She was there. Second. And this which allegiance is when Sayyidina Uthman went to Mecca and the news came in that he was killed. And our Rasul says, who is going to give me allegiance will be with me and we will get our revenge against or for Sayyidina Uthman. It was a rumor. She was there. Billah alaykum. When I was reading this, when I was writing and preparing this, I took a pause and I said, can I say laqad radiya Allahu an al mu'mineen on myself? Can I claim it? Do I even have the, 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 the audacity to say it? Of course she say it. And of course she can say it with full confidence. Why? Because Allah said it. Allah said it. Her son, so now she's a mother. Her son, Rasul Rasulullah sent him to talk to Musaylama al-Kadhab. Musaylama, the one who claimed prophethood. And Musaylama stood in front of him, her son, Habib, and he said, do you bear witness that, Rasool, that, that Muhammad is Rasulullah? He said, I do. And he said, do you bear witness that I am a messenger? And he says, no. Every time he asks him this question, the answer is no. He chop one part of his body, a hand, an arm, every part till he died. Later on, in the Yamama, in the battle of Yamama, after the death of Rasulullah, she was there fighting with her other son. And she saw him dead. And she said the meaning of Alhamdulillah. That Allah made my heart in peace because he was killed. Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Umar, the giants, men, they used to go and visit her specifically. You want your right? You want to be identified? You want to be special? It's not words, it's action. It's action, and it's a hard one. And somebody, most people don't do it, but you will do it, not to impress anyone other than Allah. Not looking for any praise other than His praise. Not wanting anything of this dunya other than the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She died 13 years of hijrah. They said that she died at the time of Sayyidina Umar. No one talk about how she looks like. This is where I want to end. No one said about her skin color, or how long her hair, or what was her weight, or how tall, or what did she dress, or where she bought. But everyone talks about her courage, sacrifice, faith, certainty. How much we have of this. 
سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه تسليما كثيرا جزاكم الله خيرا Assalamu alaikum, Jazakum Allah khairan, Dr. Haifa. We're going to do a Q&A. The first question is for Ustada Maryam. So it says, how do I build my confidence to put my face on social media? I have studied Islam and counseling. I have so many things I would love to share so I could also connect with like-minded people. I feel like I learned so much yet only have a minimal friends to share with. When I share, I feel amazing. I also want to have the right intention and have been told that I could attract the Ain. Uh, so I might, you know, she doesn't want to obviously be a target for Ain. Can you give her some advice about being in the public eye and avoiding the eye, perhaps? Um, just being using social media for good and how to kind of a, a check your intention. When I first joined social media, it was because I wanted to make da'wah to a cohort that I was part of and just help them see the beauty of Islam. Um, in that time, I never put my face up and I was just like, absolutely, I would never put anything related to my person online. Um, and I just want to share with you this development because I think it's important for us to think about all the different aspects if anyone's doing public work. Uh, over time, uh, as I was giving lectures, some of my lectures were shared online, and so slowly my, my, my face is online more and more because people are sharing the lectures. Uh, and then eventually, I started getting messages from sisters who were really struggling with being a visible Muslim. Just very, very, very hard. There was an era, an era in which a lot of social media influencers who had established hijab um, companies and who had been kind of like the pillars of, um, you know, in, encouraging hijab, were going through a difficult time and removing their hijab. And may Allah bless all of them. And hijab is a very, you know, difficult subject in so many ways. Um, so in that time, I was getting so many questions related to just hijab and being public and all of that. And so I started to ask my teachers and um, the, pe the people who mentor me, scholars who mentor me, about how to help women see themselves in different areas. And one of the pieces of advice that I kept receiving was they need to see other Muslim women who are in different spaces. It's one thing to see, you know, um, flowers with a caption, um, and it's another thing for them to see someone who they can relate to. And I have to say that it's, I am physically, like, I don't post my picture unless there's a reason. I don't have, like, it's, it's a personal choice. I just, I don't have, like, some photo shoots of myself, like, at the beach. And respectfully to anyone who does it, that's just not my style. I try to make sure that what I post is with an intention that is showing other women or it's talking about an aspect of character. That's a personal thing. Videos, I've talked to Dr. Haifa about in the past. The style of social media right now is videos are here. And it was something I really struggled with because when I did take a video from, you know, like that pillar over there, um, people just felt like they couldn't connect to it. And I would get that feedback. And I want to say that I really dislike being social on social media. I hate having my picture on social media. I hate being in videos on social media. I would completely leave social media if it wasn't for the messages that I receive, specifically from women who talk about how just seeing the visibility has made an impact on their lives. And it's not because I'm actually doing anything good or because I'm worthy of that. It's just literally sometimes someone needs to see someone else to feel like there's community and they just feel that community. And so when I'm sharing with you this advice, I'm sharing it from a place of hating being public. I don't like to be public, and I wouldn't encourage someone to be public, not because it's not helpful. I've told Dr. Rania to get a TikTok. I asked Dr. Haifa to get a TikTok. I think... all of us on TikTok. Okay. Let me just say, I told everyone, but two of them actually did it. So what that says about them, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. Some of them are the chosen. I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. Um, TikTok is a beast. <laughs> but the people on TikTok are you, young people. And the types of messages that they're hearing on there are from people who know nothing about Islam. 
who have 500,000 followers and who are like, women, you are the majority of hell. And I'm like, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. This is what young people in high school and in college are hearing about Islam. And their rea reality that they're living is so supportive. Be whoever you want, be whatever you want, flaunt what you got, everything you want, you're accepted. But in the Muslim community, no, abs don't be whoever you no, hide everything about your existence because it's better for women not to exist in the first place. And that, that message is really hard for a young person who's struggling to figure out what their identity is. And so why I'm telling you all of this, because the benefit of being on social media, I have seen it, I'm sure anyone here, Dr. Anya, Dr. Haifa, anyone else, oh, Sada Husai, why didn't I see you, Sada Husai? Sada Husai, may Allah bless them for the, the difficulty of experiencing the reality of social media. It's a beast and there's so much hate and there's so much frustration. The amount of nights I've waken up with anxiety in the middle of the night because my face is online is just so much. But what I've seen is the messages from sisters, especially younger sisters and older sisters, it's just been so worth it. And so why I'm telling you all of that is because if you feel like what you want to do is give a particular message and in a field that really needs to be represented, especially from women, especially su su um, supporting other women, I think it's such a critical, critical um, role that no, someone needs to take. What I would recommend is number one, make istikhara. I personally make istikhara before basically any post. I make istikhara multiple times before doing things and I ask for advice. I send what I'm about to post to other people, getting their feedback before I do. I think that that shura is really important and you know, the intention thing. People ask me this, they're like, how can you maintain a sincere intention with like the more and more people that might see, the more and more people that, you know, it's about followers, it's about likes, it's all those things. And like really, I think the best advice that I can give you is be an extremely insecure person because nothing will impact, you will never be good enough. And so that's my advice, just be really insecure, make a sahara. <laughs> I like that only the people here are laughing because they know my insecurities. Um, but I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, at the end of the day, you always think like, this is not coming with me to the grave except to be a punishment unless you do it for the sake of Allah. And if you're not doing it for the sake of Allah, in the end, what, what does it matter how many followers you have? First of all, Facebook was a big thing. Barely anyone uses it now, no respect. I mean, all respect to the people who actually do. And now, okay, so then all those people who had all those big followings, now what? Now TikTok is the thing. And 10 years, what it's, what's this kind of, no one's going to remember who we are. This life, this life, probably most of our names are not going to be remembered, except for, inshallah, all the sisters, of, everyone in this room, and everyone we love, I mean. But the point is that, I just really have a time for 20 minutes. Oh my gosh, the point, make your sahara, make dua, ask a lot of people. May Allah make you sincere and always ask Allah to purify your intentions, to be sincere and think about what you're doing before you do it. Make multiple intentions before you press post because really it doesn't benefit you in the long run for any other reason other than you're doing it for the sake of Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all sincere. I mean, also PS, please download Qariya, the Woman Quran Reciters app. Um, since we're talking about social media, it's on app stores, both of them, Q-A-R-I-A-H. It's free, it's for women, Qariya, the Women Quran Reciters app. I've met so many of you who are like, I love the work you're doing. I'm like, have you downloaded the Qariya? They're like, no. I'm like, why? It's free. So, all right. Can I just, just to add one thing. Yes. Jazakillah khair, ya Maryam. This was a, the, one of the best advice I was given 20 years ago. Don't learn to teach. And don't learn to be famous. Don't go on social media if you want to. Don't. Go against your nerves. Because you're going to be drained. You're going to be following. You know, how many people? They like me. They don't like me. And the followers don't. Wait. If Allah wants to use you through social media, he'll use you. What I just shared with you. The TikTok that now I am on, Allah knows how many people for years they were after me. And I was absolutely against it. You know how Allah made me do it? You've talked to me, but I wasn't convinced. At 16, you know, you know why? Because you always wait till Allah shows you. This is very important. 16-year-old boy, his mother sent me my clip. She said, someone put it on TikTok. And I said, really? It was not us, someone. And I said, and she said, please put yours on TikTok. I said, why? She said, my son really loves it. Khalas. Done. Did you see my point? So for the sister who asked, Allah gave you the knowledge, but he didn't tell you to teach. And he didn't tell you to go on social media yet. He taught you, wait, ask him to show you. 
because that's a dangerous trap. Social media, being popular, being famous, don't you think it's easy to be in the shoes? You know what I'm talking about. So wait, if Allah wants to use me, or let us tabdini. Ya Allah, use me and don't replace me. And He will use you the way He thinks is the best for you. I'm sorry I took it, but I just wanted to make this point. It's okay. The next question is actually for you, Dr. Haifa. Uh, what, to do if, what to do if two people are strongly convinced that they are being wronged by the other person? Both are taking guidance from the Quran and Sunnah, but are looking at things from a completely different, opposite lens. I'll remind you of hadith of Rasul I think he said the meaning of whomsoever leave an argument and you know you are right but you leave it look at your place in Jannah that's the answer period because if you were right and you did it your place in Jannah and if you were wrong and you live it and you left it Alhamdulillah period don't, uh, this also goes to Tuskia and to your nafs. Don't defend your nafs. I have to show her I'm right. That's your nafs talking. Leave it. Leave it for Allah. And He will absolutely defend you and show you. Bi idnillah. Jazakallah khair. Mr. Hussai, the mic. Uh, regarding privacy within the marriage, you talked about uh, transparency. What are the limits? What if others like the in laws? Ask your spouse not to share a halal but private conversation. Uh, I saw that question. I was a little confused by the context. Um, the in-laws are speaking to whom? And I, I, it was a bit confusing for me. But in general, I would say that, as I mentioned during the talk, you know, there are certain um, things that are sacred in the, in, in the marital relationship and the bond that we have with our spouses is really important to maintain. As we know, Iblis seeks to destroy the, the family because if he destroys the husband and the wife, he destroys the family, he destroys the community, has this ripple effect. So we have to be on guard and know his tactics. And having secrecy and these duplicitous natures where I have my life and you have your life and we don't ever really have transparency, I think is a very dangerous game to play. And it comes from a lot of these modern ideas about you know women and men having to always have everything as mashallah dr haifa beautifully alluded to it's always these po political ideas that come into our marriages we have to use hikmah we have to use wisdom and i think just having some some uh, basic you know uh, understandings between you and every couple is going to have to decide what that means for my for example my marriage my husband, any day, any time of the day, it is a matter of some in the middle of the night, in the morning, if he wants to see my phone, marhaba, here you go. There's no, oh no, you can't look at my stuff, it's private, he doesn't have access to my passcode. I just don't believe that that's healthy, so he can get into my phone and I can go into his phone. I have all his access to his emails, he can go into my email, he can do whatever he wants. But he knows respectfully, there are certain things that are very private, and I tell him because I have sisters that message me that for that reason, please do not touch these things because it's confidence that I have of other women or other people. But everything else between him and I, there is this understanding that there's no privacy. So I think, you know, really having a culture of mutual respect, of um, honoring one another's preferences. Some people might have more, you know, things that they are, that they want just from experiences you know I, I know people who've come out of really unhealthy relationships so they might need they might need a, a little bit more you know in their current relationship because of their past so just being compassionate and seeing people where they are and having open dialogue I think will remove a lot of the doubt and suspicion and all of those things of shaitan and um, you know that he wants to you know create between the couple so just have open communication that's that as far as in-laws and other people I mean again we have to be very clear about boundaries um, within our, our marriages and that goes for for anybody that's not involved in the marriage you can always seek advice but to have people meddling in your marriage um, I think is also a very dangerous uh, thing so we should you know 
be very clear that we will, as a couple, for example, if we have um, problems, that we have one person, or, or at least there's a due process of how we're going to, you know, mediate our problems. But it's not this kind of, you know, open, um, haphazard way of, of, uh, of letting anybody into the marriage. Because there's things that are very private. And once you lose trust, again, this is how shaitan uh, sows those seeds of discord. So these agreements, a lot of the stuff can be taken care of with premarital counseling. So please, if you're not married, go into premarital counseling because experts like Mashallah, Dr. Rania, and others who are in the field of either mental health or do this as a professional, um, this is part of their expertise, they will guide you on how to have these contracts that are mutually beneficial. That is the key. It has to be mutually beneficial. That's very different than equal, okay? And those words, I know, are interchanged, but mutually beneficial is rooted in respect. It's rooted in, in again, taqwa, in, 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 in uh, inshallah, in the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala above the nafs. And if we, I think, conduct ourselves in that respectful way, we will have agreements um, with our spouses that uh, will not leave anyone feeling that they you know, have a need to hide or have a need to, to, uh, to do things any other way. So I hope that was clear. Uh, uh, we got a question. Um, somebody wants to take their shahada, and we don't know if it's in person Allahu or Akbar. online. Allahu so, Akbar. Because oh, Allahu yay. Akbar. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> All right. Can you tell us about yourself? I just received the question right now, so that's why. Um, so I have some friends in the community. I live in Pacifica, Madison. Nice to meet you all. Um, thank you. Um, I actually come from an atheist family, um, and I've done some research here and there about all the religions, and just so happens that this is the one that sat in my heart. Um, I had some trouble kind of connecting my head and my heart because there's some things I'm trying to learn about logic, and but I feel it in my heart, and I'm ready to say the shahada. <laughs> Yeah. So Madison, just let me give you a little bit of, uh, so you're coming to a religion which is the essence of it is the base of every religion. It's only one God, you worship and you submit. That's basically it. And all the other religions, the base is the same, but then things change. And that's probably why your heart felt there. And that's the usual story because anything else I wouldn't say it doesn't make sense, but doesn't make a pure sense. Can't be more than one. This is too perfect. This is too sophisticated to have too many people. You know what I'm saying? So it is one. So this is basically what Islam is submission to the will of God. That's what we were all talking about. And basically what I'm going to... Um, you're going to say after me, I'm going to say it in Arabic, then just say it, and then I'll say it in English. I already practiced uh, I'm going to say it in very, very slowly. <laughs> yes. I'm like driving in the car. <laughs> oh, so you're practicing. Yes, yes. And, and there's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a, a disclaimer. Honestly, we had no idea. I just read the question. I, if you saw me, I was, I leaned. Exactly. And I leaned uh, to uh, Stada Fadwa. I was like, oh, and who is she? We don't know. Alhamdulillah. So basically, the declaration of shahada, or the declaration, the door to get to Islam is that you declare two things. That Allah, God, is one, and Rasul, the messenger, Muhammad, peace be upon him, is his messenger. That's basically it. So, bismillah. Ashhadu. Ashhadu. An. An. La. La. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illa. Illa. Illa Allah. Illa Allah. Wa ashhadu. Wa ashhadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Rasulullah. Rasulullah. I bear witness. I bear witness. There is no deity. There is no deity. Other than Allah. Other than Allah. I bear witness. I bear witness. That there is Muhammad. That Muhammad. His messenger. His messenger. And the last messenger. And the last. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Welcome to us. May Allah keep us strong. Ya Rabbi. And you're in a beautiful community. May Allah keep her strong, everyone. She's in an amazing community. Make a dua for us. I'm jealous because you're pure. And I mean it. The person who enters Islam, everything else is white. So I have a lot of things to, to clear. Everybody. She is pure whiteboard. So welcome, my dear. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you a key that you guide other people. Ya Rabbi Amin. Now you can hug. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes.
Yes. On behalf of the Rahma Foundation, especially the MCC, we wanted to give you this gift box called Being Muslim. Inside you'll find a Quran and a prayer rug and some other books to kind of begin the journey and some other goodies and things. But we are here in person. So this is for you, Madison. This wasn't planned. <laughs> this wasn't planned at all. <laughs> they just brought this out of nowhere. <laughs> out of nowhere. I'm doing that. I'm doing that. MCC, mashallah, may Allah bless this masjid and the convert committee that's yes. here. There's some wonderful programming here, and we hope you'll join us. You will connect with my, yeah, Of course, but it's my first hug. I just, I just, <laughs> I just came with you on YouTube. I'm serious. I, I just found you on YouTube. Are you serious? I'm serious. She's saying, really? She's saying she just found us on YouTube a week ago. Allah Akbar. Allah guides whom he wills. Mashallah. <laughs> We're here for you too. MCC, yes. Huddle, huddle, huddle. Madison, huddle. This is the most COVID friendly thing I've done. Huddle, huddle, huddle. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. Madison, the Muslim. The superhero. MashaAllah. You know, I want to say one thing. Whenever you do a good deed, the sign that the good deed is accepted when Allah follows with another good deed. So look at this. Subhanallah. You came, you support, may Allah reward all the organizers. And this is the second time, actually. Yeah. This is the third conference. This is the second time. Last time, the same thing happened. And that lady was actually not in the conference. She texts and says, wait for me. Remember? Yes. And we waited for her. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. May Allah accept from all of us. May Allah make us an example to the people outside that they see us and they want to enter Islam, Ya Rabbi. All right, back to the questions. Just real quick, Sada Hussai, who was the one who slapped Amina radiallahu anha? Abu Jahid. For those of you taking notes, all right, Sada Hussai again. So, what author's books did you utilize for your talk and would you recommend to learn from? I remember. Um, I have some children's books on like Sahab and Sahabiyat and then online sources. There's mashallah a lot of hadith um, websites, a lot of the contents available on hadith and there's also great talks. I listened to one by, um, which is a really great talk, Dr. Omar Suleiman, mashallah he did. He has a series so I would definitely recommend listening to that one. I, is it the first? I don't know the if first. that's the title of it. I'm sorry. Yeah, the but first. Yeah, he, he did it on different, uh, like, Sahaba and Sahabiyat, yes, so, mashallah. mashallah, very rich uh, information, yeah. Uh, Dr. Rania, as we know about the roles of women outside of motherhood, but for me it's been challenging to learn about Sahabiyat during their pregnancies and, and challenges other than the story of Asma and Maryam. It is a blessing, but uh, there are mental, physical challenges in which our culture would minimize them. Are there any resources for that? Also, does Medistan offer therapy or care for postpartum depression? Absolutely. Absolutely. I could probably talk about postpartum depression forever, subhanAllah, and how much our cultures and ourselves, particularly even as women, but I'll also say all people, including doctors. I can't tell you how many doctors don't believe in postpartum depression. It's the strangest, weirdest thing. I'm like, how did you graduate from medical school and you don't know that postpartum depression is real? Sometimes it's their own wives as physicians that I'm, they're saying, eh, get over it. What do you mean get over it? Have you not studied that particularly, I'm going to go into a whole spiel now, forgive me, but <laughs> certain mental health conditions are biologically connected. Postpartum depression is absolutely one of those because it is hormonally based more often than not. Other types of sometimes in the postpartum depression itself or other forms of depression and anxiety could also have environmental causes. So if you're living in some really difficult circumstances, think about all kinds of things that kind of really cause you anxiety and difficulty could also cause you postpartum depression after the birth of the child. Or now we most likely call it peripartum depression, even within the pregnancy and after it. Or if it's not biological and it's not genetic and it's not environmental, it could be actually cognitive, it could be spiritual, it could be many different things actually. But to me, it's so amazing that we get so stuck on these things can't possibly be true when in reality, the very same hormones that allow that baby to be in the mother's womb and carried for all those months is also are the same hormones implicated in postpartum depression. 
If you believe pregnancy can happen, then you believe postpartum depression can happen too. Plummeting of those hormones causes some women to experience postpartum depression. We had, I don't know how many, Ustada Fadr, how many do we have in the room? Over 300, yeah? The stats are one in four women experience postpartum depression. Now count off, one, two, three, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> there are so many women in this room alone, plus all of our sisters online. We see you in here and we love you, mashallah who also have experienced postpartum depression in their life. So when women negate that, I'm like, hold on. <laughs> you know your own sisters and yourselves. This is very common. The quicker that we can actually get over this issue and be there as a support for each other, the better we're all going to be for it. The better that we say to our own daughters and our own sisters, snap out of it, or shame on you, Allah gave you a kid, how dare you be upset? A'udhu billah. These are real things that happen. And so, in short, yes, Maristan, alhamdulillah, is our local Islamic nonprofit that dedicated, it's dedicated to mental health and actually integrating Islam into the therapy. It offers all kinds of therapy and support, alhamdulillah, professional by those who are trained professional therapists. The booth is at the back. I think Sister Tismita is here somebody, somewhere and can answer your questions, inshallah. But also, please know that it is also virtual. So again, for the state of California, anybody in the state of California can access that care. And also please know that we also make sure that it's financially available. MCC has been a wonderful partner. We're able to have financial support for those who can't afford the therapy. And I encourage everybody to get that support, even if it's not postpartum depression, even if it's family counseling for your own kids, if it's academic support that people are struggling with, test taking anxiety, let's say, or whatever kinds of difficulties, please get the help, folks. Now back to the sister who's asking, what can I do about the stories related to pregnancy that seems that I was very clear about the story that I told about Sayyidah Amina, the mother of the Prophet وسلم, what she experienced was a miracle. Are we clear about that? The Prophet وسلم, is entirely a miracle. And so clearly his pregnancy was going to be a miracle too. The fact that she didn't feel the heaviness that a woman feels when carrying a child or the difficulty that comes with it, or the very mere fact that when he was born, he didn't have any of the filth, you know, the, the stuff, the fluids that are on a baby. He didn't even have that when he was born. The whole thing, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the whole story is a miracle. So clearly that's different than any one of us, right? And yeah, pregnancy's tough, <laughs> mashallah, and I too wish that our cultures and our communities would stop minimizing the difficulty that actually comes with it. And also the struggles and pains of infertility. There are struggles and pains all throughout, whether having children or not having them. And so, what do we do? We support each other. And we understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually allows for us to understand the wisdom behind either the challenges or the ease that Allah gives us that every one of those pregnancies is different or the lack of them is something also challenges and difficulties that Allah has given us to help us through into that next stage but a lot of that comes with wisdom and I hope you'll find the people along your path inshallah that'll help you understand those wisdom inshallah you mentioned that Sumayya radiallahu anha made a sacrifice, giving away something that is valuable for something that you recognize as clearly more valuable. But how do we reach the state where we can achieve those sacrifices in our daily lives, if necessary for us when pertaining to our deen, especially when it seems so hard at times? Is there anything that we can do to achieve that level of taqwa? Jazakallah khair, I really loved your talk. Jazakallah khair, and inshallah, when I reach that level of taqwa, I'll share my tips with you. Um, we're all struggling, right? We're all on a journey. Uh, nobody is perfect. Nobody has got it all figured out. Uh, so when we're talking about trying to reach a particular stage of taqwa, I don't think any of us has like, okay, next Thursday I'm going to be done, inshallah. I'll be, you know, like I've reached that stage, right? Um, so what do we do when we are faced with some sort of struggle or sacrifice? Um, I think the, the biggest thing that I would suggest, obviously after dua and turning to Allah and making sincere dua to Allah, is also make sure you have a support system. A lot of people go through these things alone. Um, they feel maybe embarrassed that uh, maybe they feel like the thing that I'm going through is trivial, so they trivialize it and they feel embarrassed because they think other people are going through worse, what do I have to complain about? Uh, and so they, they don't seek support 
or they feel like nobody in the world could possibly understand what I'm going through, I've got it so terribly, um, that they just feel like, they feel hopeless, right? And we don't want to be on either extremes and we ask Allah SWT to protect us. Always seek support. Um, you look at the lives of the prophets, والسلام, they sought support, right? Um, we look at Musa السلام, right? When Allah tasks him with going to Fir'aun, he has this entire conversation with Allah, right? Allah shows him these miracles, um, he's speaking directly with Allah, right? Then Allah shows him these amazing miracles, and then Allah tells him, go to Fir'aun, and Musa السلام, says, okay, let's go. No, he makes dua, right? First he makes dua, and then after he makes dua, what does he say? Okay, I'm going alone. No, he says, let my brother come with me, right? And Allah SWT accepts his dua. Allah doesn't say, didn't I just say I'm with you? Why are you asking? No, right? So it's okay to seek support. The Prophet Sallallahu sought support, right? What is, we know that the Prophet Sallallahu made dua that, Ya Allah, allow one of the two Umars to accept Islam. And Umar ibn al-Khattab was the one that Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam chose to bless with uh, guidance, right? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sought support. Um, so that's the first thing that I would suggest, and really the main thing I would suggest is seek support. I can guarantee that a lot of the sacrifices and the difficulties that we go through, somebody has probably gone through something similar, um, if not the exact same thing, right? Uh, so talk to your sisters in the community, get to know your sisters, reach out to professionals if you need to, but don't go it alone, okay? Keep your du'as with Allah, keep Allah close to you, ask Allah for help, but also seek support from your community, from the sisters who love you. I pray that Allah SWT makes it easy for us all to reach a level of taqwa that he's pleased with. Um, yes, yes, please go ahead. Sure. Just quickly, Jazakia al Excellent advice. And I just wanted to echo everything you just said as far as support systems. Alhamdulillah, we are so blessed in this community to have, mashallah, Dr. Rania and Maristan and this organization that provides professional services. But here at MCC, too, we're also head in that direction of trying to really create support systems that are, uh, you know, more uh, just for, for those who don't really, or are not ready maybe perhaps to, to seek out, or maybe they are and they're doing it, um, you know, uh, in conjunction with, but they want actual sahba. So we just recently, with, it's been a couple of months, but here the last Saturday of every month at MCC from 9 to 11 a.m. in that room, Myself and a few other sisters in this community come together, we read Quran, we do dhikr, we do salawat, and then at the end we do something that is exactly as everything that Ustada Fasina was talking about, which is seeking support, but in a very uh, non-intrusive uh, way, it's just a, it's a, whatever, whoever wants to share, um, and it's really just healing and, and uh, holding space with one another, listening to one another, and alhamdulillah, I've been doing this for a, a pretty long time, and I feel like every single time we do those dua circles where everybody kind of just shares whatever's burdening them, I always get a lot of feedback that I really needed this today. I needed to feel held by my sisters, heard, and then I feel like most of us, alhamdulillah, Allah, you know, has, I think women generally, we tend to know the solutions to our problems, right? Which is why one of the biggest complaints women have of their spouses is they're always trying to solve their problems. And you're like, I don't want you to solve my problem. I just want you to listen to me complain about my problems. Uh, and I think validation and really just having a comforting voice. I mean, just even being up on this panel, I feel so reassured when I can see, like, mashallah, so for saying she's been awesome, nodding her head, letting me know, yes, what you're saying is resonating. And, or, you know, all of my co-panelists, it's very comforting to the human heart, right, to be seen and to be heard. And we're missing that. That's the bottom line. We are so disconnected as a community. And the problem is, is we come into a lot of these spaces because of the pressures of what being perfect at everything, being the superwoman, I have to have it handled, that we are leading with, a, with the facade and the persona that we want people to think of us and to find spaces where we can just be real and raw without judgment. And you, you, you share at your own discretion. So there's no expectation to share, but there's permission to share. So I invite all of you, if you would like, it's open. There's no commitment required. But I, we created this program specifically for this, to create places of sohbah. So 
May Allah give us all, you know, support and let us all come together, inshallah. This is beautiful, sisterhood. And that's why we love Rahma Foundation and we love Jannah Institute and we love all of our female-led organizations because this is what they're doing. Alhamdulillah. Just and we love the Qari app. Yes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Estela Mariam is next. A couple of questions regarding um, can women follow the janazah and watch the burial of their loved ones and can pregnant women go to the cemetery and also um, uh, going for Hajj or Umrah while the Nifas or Haid. What, what are some resources about figuring out how to do that? Um, and I know you're, you have a book coming out in six months, inshallah. Inshallah. Um, so with regards to just because we're we, I don't we're not giving a whole class I won't give you all the different opinions and the reasonings why I'll just give you the base answer yes it is permissible to follow the Janazah and to attend the burial pregnancy menses none of those have a, a weight on whether or not you do that um, that includes washing the body you don't need to not be on your period to be uh, do so however let me just say you are going to see a difference of opinion sometimes from scholars and I'm not going into all the details of that right now just because of this this the reality but the point is that there are going to be some of the same exact texts are understood differently by different scholars and different madahib. So yes, there are going to be scholars who say that it is impermissible. And then there are other scholars who refute that and they provide their proofs on why it is permissible, amongst which the Prophet ﷺ passed a woman who was um, upset emotionally at the grave of her son. And she didn't realize it was the Prophet ﷺ and he reminded her to be patient and she spoke um, uh, disrespectfully, um, just in the moment of her grief, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi didn't tell her, you're, you're not allowed to be here. Um, he's a legislator of law. He, it is an, an incumbent upon him to make that clarification, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If someone is in the middle of doing something that's not that's not correct and he sees it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, Aisha radiallahu anha, she went and visited the grave of her brother, um, radiallahu anhu, and then a companion saw her and asked about specifically, aren't women not supposed to be going? And I'm just super summarizing this. Um, but she responded, she asked the Prophet Sallallahu in another narration, what should she say when she goes to visit the grave? The Prophet Sallallahu taught her what to say. So these are all evidences on women going, visiting the grave. There are a number of them from the Sahabiyat um, that exist, and that came after the initial prohibition and then the order to go, with the, uh, the recommendation to go. Other scholars who would disagree with this are going to look at those later narrations and give reasonings. Aisha radiallahu anha only visited her brother because he couldn't, she couldn't attend the janazah, for example. They're going to give their reasonings on why, no, actually, this is not meant for all women. This is a specific circumstance. Do you see where I'm coming with, like, how the, the, the scholars look at it differently? Sorry, I can't go into it more here, but the point is um, there is ample evidence to allow for it uh, to be done. With regards to the um, mensis question, Yes, so to go into Hajj or Umrah, you don't, um, the only part you absolutely need to be in wudu in. You can get into your ihram on your period. You can do the other rites on your period, but you cannot make tawaf. However, if you're in Hajj or Umrah and you're only going to be there a few days and you don't live, you know, an hour or two hours away that you can just, you know, be in ihram for a certain amount of, or excuse me, never mind, I won't say that part. Ignore what I just said. The point is, not everyone's group can just stay longer until a woman's period is done. That's just not realistic today. And so if you are not able to make Umrah without being pure from your period, then Ibn Taymiyyah and a number of other scholars mention that yes, you can make the tawaf on your period because you don't have another choice. There's a discussion on whether or not a woman needs to give a sacrifice for that. Ibn Taymiyyah's opinion is not, but there's other discussions on um, whether or not it should be done. So if you are going to go for Hajr Umrah, I would recommend reaching out to your Hajj or Umrah group, although now you can go on your own, so maybe that doesn't exist. I can't tell you a, um, a source that I know of in English. If you, anyone knows, please share it. That's why part of the book that, alhamdulillah, I finished writing the manuscript on has a whole section on this, just because I couldn't find it in English. Inshallah, I pray it'll be beneficial in a year, inshallah. Um, but if anyone has resources, please share. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah khair. Make dua that the book comes out and it's pleasing to Allah. A couple of couple of points for the ladies. When there is a different opinion, what you need to do is you need to respect both. It doesn't matter which one you follow. And I say this to myself, number one, who, are, who I am to argue. Following, there is two things about janazah. There's following the janazah and then being in the graveyard side during the barrier. And then there is visiting the graveyard afterwards. There's three things you have to separate. 
Now, it all depends upon the scholars who tells you you, you are allowed to, what you are going to be doing there. I don't know if you have been there, I have been there. It's one of the hardest things you'll see, is when you put your loved one in a grave. If you don't think you can obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that moment, then don't go. If you can, and it's a reminder, this is actually why he allowed it later on, Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam. He said it, كُنْتُ نَهِيتُكُمْ عَنْ زِيَارَةِ الْقُبُورِ فَزُورُوهَا فَإِنَّا تُذَكِرُكُمْ بِالْآخِرَةِ I prevented you from visiting the graveyard, now go, because it reminds you of the Akhirah. So if the woman is going to go composed, dressed, pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I attended one, and I said to myself, now I know why some scholar says don't go. And I am a woman. So if you are going to go, pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, dress code, actions, what are you doing, then yes, you can follow that opinion. If you cannot obey Allah in whatever the way it is, then don't go. Because you are starting something, others may follow you, and then you need to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you need to know there's two opinions, both are valid. As uh, Ustada Maryam said, the discussion is, is this is valid, this is valid. But you, as a person, when you are there, what are you going to be doing? I, I attended one young woman. They were putting her in the grave, and people were doing selfie. I attended. It's not I heard. I did see it. And then I said, now I know when some scholar says don't do it. Uh, Dr. Amina, can you share a bit about how women who converted in secret even hiding their faith from their husbands, manifested their day-to-day -day practice of Islam. So how do they take care of their obligations? Do we know? So, subhanAllah, at the time of Umm al-Fadl, actually a lot of the, the pillars of Islam that we have now were mandated in the second year of Hijrah. So she had been Muslim for a long time. And what we don't, like, again, subhanAllah, I think we all kind of talked about this. The first 13 years in Mecca was, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who are you? Like, when you look at the Meccan Qur'an, which is the overwhelming majority of the Qur'an, it's about good character and it's about good ethics. And the re reason I think this is so important is, like there's the hadith of the Prophet where he says, Do you know who's broke? And they said, Ya Rasulullah, the one that doesn't, doesn't have any dollars or cents. <laughs> and he said, no, he's a person that prays and fasted and then comes the day of judgment, they insulted so and so and they, did, they hit so and so. They did. Like, subhanAllah, you lose all of your good deeds that way. So part of first and foremost grounding ourselves in ethics, subhanAllah, at the time, they didn't, the, the salat, they used to pray once in the morning and once in the evening, and it was only two rak'ahs, and they would only, the fasting that they would do, because like if you're trying to hide your iman, those are the two major things, you would, and they had to fast the day of Arafah, then Ramadan was not mandatory yet. I've had a lot of friends that would tell me stories of praying in the closet. And I know other people of like, oh, you can't pray in the bathroom. That was the only place that it was private enough for them to be able to pray, they just close the toilet seat. Like if you can, if you can worship freely, thank Allah for that. Because you don't realize how incredible an opportunity that is, subhanAllah. If someone can, like may Allah protect us, if someone leaves Islam, or someone actually becomes Muslim, they usually do it during their college years. And there's so many people I talk to, they're like, we can't tell our parents. We, will, we won't be able to go to, co can't go to college anymore. So there's a, a lot of very real implications in people's lives. And especially, like, subhanAllah, you don't know, if you don't know how your family is going to react, you try it a bit by bit. And you take your time with it, and you seek counsel, and you do your best. SubhanAllah. I mean, I, especially, like, there's, I mean, right now the stakes are, do I get to graduate from college or not? Do I have financial support or not? There are people, may Allah protect us. It's literally, your life is on the line if you become Muslim. May Allah protect us from that. Can I add something about the Hajj? No one has their period for the two, whole two weeks of Hajj. Like fiqhan, you, that it does, you can't. And unfortunately, the most popular opinion out there is like, just take the pills. For you to take the pills where it regulates your period enough, you have to take them for three months, which means that before Ramadan, you started taking them. The overwhelming majority of women don't do that. And if you go and you miss one, and then you start spotting, and then people get confused, and now they're frustrated, and they're like, am I not praying? Am I not praying? Like, it just, it, it frustrates me because the way it's told is like, oh, just go take care of that. Go be less woman at Hajj. You don't have to be any less woman at Hajj. Like, 
It just, it's so, like, I'm did, thank you. I went, when I went, like, I was, I was in a really large group, and I'm telling the, the male scholars, I'm like, oh, so the women that are still on their periods, just send them to me. Because I was also still just, on, I was still on my period. I was waiting till I was done, and then I took the group, we did our Umrah. And then if you get, like, there's, more, Maryam and I are working on scenarios. Hopefully, if we can have it published before next Hajj, that would be great, inshallah. But really, alhamdulillah, like, there's, there's ways to talk about it. And there's ways to figure it out. And if in the extreme case that you got your period the morning of Eid, then you just missed the time of when the tawaf became mandatory, and you can't, you're not going to finish before you leave because you're bleeding more than seven days, then, okay, now then you can take the exception. But for the overwhelming majority, it's like a statistical anomaly that that would actually happen. Not, not to get too nerdy. Anyways. <laughs> All right. So Dr. Uh, Haifa, um, can I call the event in my home when no one else is home? Maybe the medium would love to demonstrate an event for us. Uh, can I call the event in my home when my teenage son is home but doesn't want to do it? Why do you want to do it? You always have to ask yourself, why do you want to invent the wheel? And you know Sahabi at the time of Rasulullah Sam had a beautiful voice. And say that Aisha couldn't stand up and do her other. Why do you want to do it? I, I think this is something we women really need to. So one of the speakers said, Don't fall in that trap. If they didn't do it, don't do it. You know what I would worry about? Worry about your quality of salah. Worry about your khushua. Worry about what you are reading in the salah. Why do you want to do the adhan? And if your son doesn't want to do it, guess what? How many apps that uh, do the adhan these days? I attended recently a home. The whole house had the adhan. Honestly. And I was like, where is this coming from? And they just showed me the phone. And that was connected to all their speakers. Don't waste your energy, my beautiful sisters, in things that may not get me to Jannah. And I said may not. Focus on things for sure guaranteed. I don't have a lot of life to live, or thousands of hours. There's different opinion about it. In general, the woman is not supposed to call for a dan. So why do I want to do that? Period. Yani, you want to practice your voice? Memorize the Quran. Allahu Akbar. Done. Uh, 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 a lot of times in conferences and lectures we get the push to make a change in the Ummah and make a difference. I really admire all the people starting institutions and leading organizations, but I feel spread thin just from focusing on raising a righteous family, being a good wife, dealing with family issues, and keeping up with my own deen. How can I do it all like you all? <laughs> uh, Dr. Rodney is going to answer this. <laughs> We could tell the we could tell the Dr. Rania we could tell the story of uh, Dr. Rania tell the story of uh, early first women's dean intensive. So we we wanted we want I'll tell, I'll start the story but then she can talk about how she juggles and uh, a lot of it has to do with support. Uh, but we I mean you guys see the the pretty side of of us coming to the conference like we had to plan dinner. You know, our spouses, alhamdulillah, are, are, are supportive in that, um, you know, they're taking on responsibilities that we would otherwise do. Uh, we don't say they're babysitting because we are both parents to our children. All of the things that you had to do, and I talked about this that starting at 2 o'clock, we gave sisters a chance to, like, make a good breakfast or brunch, you know, finish your laundry, do the grocery shopping, and then come rest at MCC while you listen to your... Uh, program, we, the same thing happens on the other side of the stage. Sisters had to travel, you know, uh, uh, make plans, come from different areas. So all of the logistical things, but I think for a lot of our teachers, the, the intention, uh, wanting to do and serve the community, uh, putting whatever Allah facilitates for us is what we do. Um, you know, we can't always be at every program, at every talk, fill every request, but just trying to be open to everything that we can do. And I know a lot of amazing sisters who are doing work in the community that nobody knows about, whether it's feeding people, providing them groceries, watching children, you know, uh, 
um, so just to facilitate somebody else being able to do what they want. It's happening everywhere. A lot of the silent soldiers that nobody hears about, you know, all of that is happening. So do, don't minimize what you are doing as long as you're doing something. And you have to ask yourself, what is, like Dr. Haifa says, you know, not what I want to do, but what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opening up for me to do? What is that path that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made easy for me? And do that. And just go with it. Uh, because there's a lot of things that you may think are better than other things, but you don't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how he's created your path to Jannah. And so just walk whatever path Allah opens for you, and inshallah it will get you to where we all want to be, which is inshallah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, chilling in the Jannah, Ameen. drinking milk Ameen. and eating honey. And inshallah, that's what we want. We want to be together. Are you Anyhow, uh, Dr. Rania. No, no, that was perfect. <laughs> Wasn't it? Yeah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Uh, instead of Sina. How do you suggest finding balance between sacrificing time in this dunya and making time to build your akhirah? Uh, balancing the career and seeking knowledge. Oh, that's an interesting one. So, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, actually, we don't. We only have seven minutes. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a three-minute answer, inshallah, or try. Here's the thing, right? Um, it's a very broad question because there's this idea that they're kind of mutually exclusive. Um, there's also this idea. A lot of the times, I think when we see speakers on the stage and we hear so much about what they've done. We don't realize that this is years, years of work, right? Um, uh, the other thing is everybody's situation is different, right? Um, so what one person is able to do with the resources Allah has blessed them with, another person may not be able to do. They've got other talents that Allah Santa has given them. Um, also, even as an individual, right? I'm gonna ask you all a question. Raise your hand if your entire life has always been the same. Nothing's ever, ever changed in your life. Nothing, it's been just permanently the same. All right, most people are not like that, right? Um, you're, you might be single, then you're married. You might have kids, you might be working, then you're staying at home, right? People's situations change, and so we have to allow our uh, actions to kind of mold and to, to kind of go with the flow, if you will, right? Um, I'll give you a personal example. Uh, for example, when I started the Qalam Seminary in 2015, it was a one-year program. They're, they have a five-year Alimiya program now. They don't have it anymore, or they, they didn't have it at the time. Um, so I did, the, I did a year of Arabic, then I did a year of seminary. These were all full-time, I wasn't working, right? Then I realized I have to pay bills, so I should probably get myself a job and get back to work. Um, then Qalam started their five-year Alimiya program. I was like, this is amazing. I'd really like to be able to do this. But honestly, I can't afford to take five years off of work and study full-time. I just can't. It's not something I can afford to do. Um, so what I did is I joined uh, different institutions that do part-time classes that I can do online. That's around the time when I did my hifz, I did my ijazat and the qira'at. Um, and so forth, right? So you have to allow yourself to find a way based on your situation. You have to be practical, right? You're, you're not going to race around like I, I, did a, I did a master's degree in Islamic studies during COVID and the only reason I was able to do it is because of COVID, um, where the university is in London and they decided to offer their classes online because of COVID. I, it's been my dream to go to this university and study there. I was like, I can't afford to quit my job and move to London. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, made it easy for me and oh from um university of london they have um, a department called soas um so i did my master's degree from there but it was easy because I, all i had to do was 7 a.m to 9 a.m i would take a class and then i'd go, get to work and i did that for a year right um so allah Santa will open doors for you your job is to never lose touch do whatever you can that's practical, that fits your schedule, right? Don't, don't say, okay, I have to memorize Quran in six months, I have to master the Arabic language in three months, I have to 
quit my job and leave my family and move abroad. Or what works for one person doesn't work for the other person. What works for you won't work for other people and so forth, right? So I think that's what it is, is you have to prioritize, you have to be balanced, but don't lose touch, right? Um, we have so many uh, organizations and such now, alhamdulillah, that offer different courses and stuff. You'll find something that works for you. Make dua to Allah that Allah SWT will make it easy. Um, and you will find things that you can do. Also, keep knocking at the door. Sometimes, like, if you want to study, uh, the door doesn't open. Um, and then you get frustrated. I remember uh, I was uh, taking Maliki Fik with Sheikh Hamza, and it was like, Tahara prayer, Tahara prayer, Tahara prayer. I think I took the same book, like, four or five times. Because it was the only one that was being offered at the time in the area, and I wasn't able to go abroad to study. And I, so I, I, I went, I did the worst thing ever. I went to Sheikh Hamza and complained. <laughs> and I said, Sheikh Hamza, I, you know... It's kind of like I'm doing the same book over and over again, and I feel like, you know, I wish I could go. I was complaining because I w couldn't go anywhere to study, and he said, you know, there are people who want to study, and there are people who want to want to study. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he said, check your intention. Maybe you want to want to study, which means like you want to be part of that group that wants to study, but you don't actually firmly have an intention to study. And then uh, I was like, okay. And then we got a resident scholar from the country I wanted to study in. And then we got another one. And then we got another one. And so alhamdulillah, he brought that to my attention and uh, set me straight. Uh, this one's for you, Dr. Rania, so you can have the mic. Uh, you mentioned blended families. Do stepchildren become mahram? Uh, do you need to wear a veil around stepchildren or adopted children? Do husbands, siblings, parents, and children become your mahram? So all the fifth questions, mashallah. Well, kind of, I'm going to take the approach that Ustada Maryam took and say that there actually are some differing opinions related to the nuance questions, because these are multiple. I don't even think I caught them all right there. But all the different questions. I think I want to go back to the more important piece of this and then tell you references and resources where you can learn more about the specific case. The reason for that is it has a lot to do with the ages of when these children come into the family. It has to do with whether they were nursed or not. There's so many different pieces to this particular uh, question. And so it's probably not going to make a whole lot of sense to do a whole fiqh lesson right at this very moment. But the broader question that I think is maybe fueling perhaps some of this is the concept of blended families. And I was talking about the household of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how there were multiple, multiple different people in that household. Particularly, I mean, the one where he, after he's married with the Sitna Khadija, radiallahu anha, and of course there's her children. There are, uh, at the time, like we said, adopted son, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarified that adoption is different than biological children, so Zayd bin Haritha. There is Sitna Baraka that we talked about today. There's also, and then her children <laughs> that come into the picture, right? And then there is, of course, the uh, Sayyidina Ali, so his own cousin, right, who is brought into the household as well, and then his own children. So what I meant by the blended family is that you have so many different, today this is what we call this term. We call it a blended family in which you have different people from different families that are all, or different, uh, you know, that are not necessarily all related to each other who are living in one household. And I think the bigger part of the question here is how do you keep that kind of peaceful atmosphere with so many different types of people? When sometimes, subhanAllah, even with biological people all related to you, it's hard to keep any peace at all. <laughs> subhanAllah. And I think what I'll end on since that, you know, I said the earlier part of references is really has to do with learning the fiqh of the rules, right, the, the actual rules, related to the nuance of your particular family, if you are in a blended family or hope to one day be, you're considering that for yourself, is to definitely seek out your teacher, you know, the fiqh teacher of your community, the, the person who can answer those nuanced questions for you as one important place. Secondly, to learn for yourself too, because this comes down to our own fardai knowledge about, you know, um, it really comes down to understanding lineage and understanding who's related to who and who is a mahram to who, which is really important because then it comes into the rules of do you cover in front of the person, do you not? Is this person considered like your brother, sister or not? Can I marry them? Can my children marry these people? And so on and so forth. So it's actually pretty important rules here. And they're all taught in the science of fiqh or Islamic law. So I hope, inshallah, you'll, if it's inspired you to take some of these classes, they are offered. As we were saying, find the opening, inshallah, and the place to, to learn them uh, for yourself. So seek out a teacher who can answer the question for your nuance, 
learn for yourself and take some of the questions, some of the fifth classes yourself, inshallah, if you haven't already. And thirdly, if you are in a blended family or a part of it or have those extended to you that are part of that, do seek out the kind of support and help. And this is my plug, I'll put the plug in again, of kind of getting that therapy and support and help when needed because this is not an easy situation. We said the Prophet's household, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was the most peaceful and happy household of the entire region. They had the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. <laughs> right? The one who, the perfect of all creation, who taught us how to be, uh, have the kind of adab and with the kind of wisdom and treatment of each other that today you would call interpersonal relations. If we can learn that prophetic model from the sunnah of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all of us would do better. And until that's the case, we all need some help, mashallah. And if you are not able to figure this out on your own, this is where the Quran tells us, ask the people of knowledge if you do not know. That could come in the form of our teachers, our counselors, but potentially also those who've professionally studied marriage and family counseling. That can be in the form of professional therapists who are Muslim, hopefully drawing from the sunnah as well. So that's my plug. And Maristan is in the corner, inshallah. So seek out that kind of support and help. Jazakallah khair. We did get a number of questions about, uh, just big questions about, like, you know, if, uh, if the baby's female and urinates on you, things like that. There's a lot of big questions. I, again, I would just reiterate and say, take a, take a good class. It'll, take, it'll walk you through all of those scenarios, and then you'll feel confident when you're worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think that's one of the best things about. Uh, taking time to study the basics, especially tahara, because it's everyday stuff, is that you just worship with confidence, and then you don't have that in the background, wondering, am I doing this right? It's just clarity, alhamdulillah. Um, before I ask the speakers to give us ways to contact them, we have two more questions. I used to wear hijab. I don't anymore due to past trauma. I've been contemplating wearing it again, but I have dealt with the past sexual assaults and other trauma. It's difficult to reconcile the trauma with my deen and hijab. Things within the deen can be triggering while I try, while I try to work past it. Uh, your advice. SubhanAllah. This is something I always say to myself, and we all have to do. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us always keys for khair and not keys for the opposite. Obviously, I mean, I think, Allahu alam, is that this person, the trauma came from a religious person or quote-unquote practicing person, Allah knows. And this is where the trauma is. This is a very difficult situation. There is no answer will be given in a one minute for this. We need to talk. This person needs definitely counseling, professional counseling. Um, to get over the trauma, and of course Rania is way more professional than me and knowledgeable in this case, but you need to have counseling to get over the trauma itself first. Yes, the trauma is related to, to religion, but also that you have the trauma in there, so this needs to be taken care of. And then the second thing is the hijab related to that, and we need to dig into it, why is that? But if I want to just give a general answer, and it's probably not going to be enough for that person, but for everybody. This is what I will say always. When you have a hard time forgiving someone, which we all have, I always remind myself of this. How many times I have disobeyed Allah? How many major sins I have committed? Major. I'm not talking about minor. Myself. And everybody say the same question. But he still feed me. And he still give me a roof. And he's still waiting for me to say, Astaghfirullah. And he still wants me to go to Jannah. Why I can't do it? If you think this way, it will, the, the, the road for forgiveness will be much easier. And there is a dua in the Quran, actually, which happened as a, and Sayyidina Umar used it later on in his khilafah. رَبَّنَا لَا تَجْعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا غِلَّ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Ya Allah, don't put in our hearts any ill feeling, grudges, hate to any of the believers. Anytime you look at someone and that someone, she or he, have hurted you, Allah knows what they did. Say that dua. It works wonder. Because who is going to clear your heart? It's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that person definitely needs way more than what I just said. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make a lot of dua to everybody. And you make dua for yourself that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala heal you. Healing is, is, is not easy, subhanAllah, unless you're really connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're really at that level where you don't see anything but you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah make it easy for her. And then, uh, uh, Sorry. 
So I just... It's in Surah Al-Hashr. It's, it's a half of an ayah. It's وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ يَقُولُونَ It's رَبَّنَا لَا تَجْعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا غِلًّا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ رَؤُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ Ya Allah, don't put in our hearts ill feeling. غِل is, is hatred with anger. Both. لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Toward the believers. So that tells you a believer can hurt you. It can lead to a hatred in your heart. And then you say, رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ رَؤُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ You are all merciful. And so I want him to forgive me, then I need to do it with other people. It's in, I, I will check the number, I'll give it to you. I'm sorry? Ayah 10, alhamdulillah, Rabbana. It's, it's, the dua is in the middle of the verse. It's not in the beginning of the verse. Jazakillah. So we're I'm actually try, I'm dealing with a case where it's, it's not from a Muslim person at all. So there's a different, there's, there's two points in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about hijab. One of it, in Surah Al-Nur, where it's talking about modesty, and in Surah Al-Ahzab, it actually talks about identity. And I think it's important to distinguish the two. Because if, they're, like, I'm just going to... Actually, Dalia Muliahad did research about this. The, the spikes in Islamophobia are actually during presidential elections. It's not actually related to, to terrorist attacks or anything like this, because it is more about the rhetoric. And my, my sister, at the time, when the election was going on back in 2015, 2016, she lived in Kansas. She has four kids. The answer to her, I think, is different from an answer to me. I don't have any kids. This is my job. I live on a college campus. Like, you, you do have to use some judgment if the idea is fear. And if that is the case, because you do have a, you do have responsibility to protect your own life. Like, this is, <laughs> this is part of our sharia. But even within that, because I, I feel like there's a fear because hijab affects our identity, Make sure that if, like, like, you can tie it backwards, you can wear a cap, you can do so many different things, because ultimately, at the end of the day, I need to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, I did my best. And because this affects our identity, may Allah protect us, a lot of the times I see someone that would, would take off their hijab and feel like that was what was holding them, and then it feels like everything kind of just let go. So how do I then maintain things and collect them? Because modesty, in and of itself, is, one of, is, a, is a part of our faith. And it sometimes is embodied in hijab, but it's embodied in so many different other ways as well. And I think that's important to, to just to know that. Um, I had another thought, and now it's gone. It's past my bedtime, guys. I'm sorry. No, this was the other thing. It really, really frustrates me in the Muslim community when women are told, you wear hijab so you don't attract the men. This is our act of worship. How they make it about them. Like, I just, I don't understand. <laughs> hijab is our act of worship to remember we're more important spiritually than we are physically. Your intention in it is important because people in society tell us this is based on your value, and we're like, no, no, I'm more valuable because Allah said I'm valuable. And this is our act of worship, so your intention in it is important. The, there's, a, there's a lot of victim blaming that really makes me mad. That any time there is these, like, un these unfortunate incidents, like, what was she wearing? Who freaking cares? She's not the one that perpetrated a crime. And it just really, really, really makes me mad when people try to associate those two things. We really have to work hard to disassociate those two things because they're idiots online that are saying these things. And is we have to make sure that we are actually correcting those narratives and that we do actually have healthy relationships with our bodies and healthy relationships with our hijab and we feel spiritually uplifted wearing our hijab. And when someone is struggling with their Muslim identity, that we have grace with them of like, tell me what's going on with you spiritually. I remember I had a student that came to me and she said, I haven't prayed in three months. Do I take off my hijab? I feel like a hypocrite. And I was like, really, I think you should start praying. I don't think you should take off your hijab. They're two separate acts of worship. You don't know what brings you back to Allah. And can you imagine someone be like, well, if you didn't pray, look, you might as well not pray us. That doesn't make sense. You do as much as you can on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the hadith, the Prophet says, saddidu wa qaribu. Just really fill as many of the gaps as you can. Get as close as you can. None of us are making it to Jannah because they did it all. Nobody. We make it to Jannah because Allah is merciful. Including the Prophet Like really, can anyone worship like him? 
He said, إِلَّا أَنْ يَتَقَمَّدَنِي بِرَحْمَتِهِ Except that Allah envelops me in His mercy. SubhanAllah. You know, nobody is deserving. Allah is generous. SubhanAllah. Sorry, I know I went on a rant, but I just... May Allah protect us all. Uh, yes. Um, we're going to just do a... Tell us how you, can con how you can be contacted. So just how can we contact you after today? On, our, on the Stanford website. My, my email's on there. I'm so sorry. Are you on social media too? I'm not really. Okay, mashallah. Uh, alhamdulillah. So the easiest way to contact me is uh, Instagram or Facebook, although as the <laughs> Madhya said, who's on Facebook anymore? No, I'm kidding. I, I'm still there, but I'm much more active on Instagram. Um, and then my email, events.hosai, my first name, at gmail.com. It's always open as well. I'm notoriously difficult to contact. I really don't do social media. If you send me a message on Facebook, I'll never read it. Because um, it goes into that other inbox. You know, like if you're not friends with someone, everyone's like, what the heck is Facebook? Um, I don't do Instagram or TikTok or any of that stuff. Um, so if you really want to get in contact with me, send me an email. It's my first name, dot my last name at gmail.com. Make sure you spell Fasena and Muhammad the way I spell Fasena and Muhammad. Otherwise, I don't know who it's going to. Um, <laughs> so it's F U S E I N A dot M O H A M A D at gmail.com. Okay, if you spell either of those wrong, Allahu A'lam. <laughs> inshallah. Um, inshallah, you can get hold of me through the different organizations that I'm part of. So whether it's um, Madistan or whether through the Rahma Foundation, um, or just come see me on Friday nights, inshallah, once we start our halakas back <laughs> next month, inshallah ta'ala. Um, also, like the others that have the social media accounts that I was very much dragged into, <laughs> there are, there are uh, messages that are checked, not often by myself, but are checked there um, that you can send to, and inshallah, we'll try to get back to you, bithnillah. But just know that it is a team of people that are getting back to those. So everything's kept confidential, but you are able to reach there. I know some people have asked about trying to find emails. I'm notoriously bad with emails, but if you do send through the DMs, the direct messages or send through the organizations that then forward, hopefully you'll be able to reach me with the love. But it's much better to just find me in person. <laughs> I look forward to seeing you all on Friday nights, inshallah. Uh, you could send me a message on at the Miriam Amir, T H E M A R Y A M A M I R. That's on Instagram um, or TikTok. Uh, but more importantly, you can also simply connect with my app. <laughs> it uh, has a QR, QR code here. <laughs> Anyone who hasn't downloaded it can simply take a screenshot, and you can download it right now. <laughs> so go ahead and do that. Shala, let me know if you want to have one of these. <laughs> take them to your communities. Take them to your local halal shops, anywhere you'd like. It's free. Inshallah, next year it's going to be interactive where you can recite with the Qariyas, inshallah. Can I also say that I spent like my entire Ramadan listening to the Qariya app. Like it was literally so beautiful to recite along with other women who are reciting. It reminded me so much of my days spent in Syria with women who are hafad of the Quran and hafidat of the Quran and women who are leading in prayer. Like that was our that was that was our reality all the time. And I was not I was telling Ustad Maryam, I didn't realize how many women have never actually experienced that because they haven't met women who have memorized the Qur'an and who lead prayer with women, that is. And, or just even like Qiyam and Layz, we do them with the Rahma Foundation. Hopefully all of you have enjoyed them. But also here, right in this very room over here, we've spent so many nights all night long in Qiyam, all with women reciters. But what do you do when you're home alone? The Qariya <laughs> A'ab. Alhamdulillah. So please do download that. I think it's so worth your time, inshallah. Yeah, okay. Assalamu alaikum. Um, you can find me. I'm sure you can. Um, if you can reach me through email. It's drahifa at jannahinstitute.org. You can find me on Instagram. It's Dr. Sheikha Haifa Yunus. Uh, that's, you will find there. You can send me a message. I'll do my best to answer. I, I don't promise it's going to be right away. So please forgive me. If you call me, good luck. If you text me, another good luck. Right? Um, but may Allah make it easy. I mean, you all have to know that we have so many things to do, right? Um, go and visit our website, jannahinstitute.com. Let's uh, wrap up because it's getting way too late. Let's make a dua. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may accept from us. Bismik Allahum. Allahumma nas'aluka bikulli ismin huwalak samayta bihi nafsak aw anzaltahu fi kitabik 
أو استأثر أو علمته أحدا من خلقك أو استأثرت به في علم الغيب عندك تجعل القرآن ربيع قلوبنا وجلاء همومنا اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا واعف عنا وعافنا ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم تب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إصرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا عن القوم الكافرين صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه تسليما كثيرا جزاكم الله خير بارك الله فيكم don't forget to pray for the people of this masjid this is a really woman friendly masjid may Allah reward them and please honestly give them personally my gratitude to everybody here Rahma Foundation for sure and all the organizers and all the volunteers